Welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is April 24th, 2022, and I'm really, really happy to be here on this bright day with DJ Doc, uh, Ivan Rodriguez, uh, and we're here in uh, uh, right around 82nd, 83rd Street and uh, uh, in Riverside Park. Um, and uh, really honored to be here with DJ Doc because uh, he's one of the most prolific and accomplished uh, uh, DJs, engineers, and producers in hip-hop history. Um, he has his name credited with many of the top songs, singles, and albums um, throughout the history of hip-hop, and he is behind the sound and the uh, really the the special flair of many more uh, songs and albums that he's he's not credited for um and uh and yeah really looking forward to uh hearing his stories today um so dj doc why don't you start off start off by telling us a little bit about your family's history and background and uh how you ended up in new york uh, my mother and father were born in puerto rico then my sister and I were also born in Puerto Rico. So we actually come from Puerto Rico. We weren't born sure. in New York City. Um, my sister was born first. I was born maybe a few years later, three, four years later. And my, my father decided to come to New York City for more opportunities. So we came to New York City, I wanna say 64-ish. Okay, 64 -ish. And we came to the Upper West Side. My mother came to the Upper West Side uh, not too long thereafter, my mother and father separated. Sure. So uh, my sister and I were with my mother, my aunts. So I was raised a lot, mostly by women. Okay. So yeah, I'm yeah, very yeah. protective of women because yeah. I was raised by women, my aunts and my mother and, and my sister. And my father migrated to 48th Street, in, which was Hell's Kitchen in the early 70s, late 60s. Okay, sure. Um, so I was raised in this area that we're in now. Okay, I see. Uh, nice area, quiet. Even from early, I was, I was uh, very curious about music, the instruments, the things I would hear. Yeah. Of course, there was a lot of old classic salsa and and, uh, and ballads, Spanish ballads in my house, and my mother would always sing. Sure, sure, sure. And then uh, I started to spend weekends in Hell's Kitchen, which was a lot more exciting. Okay, yeah. It was a lot of crime, but it just was more, more exciting on, huh? than it was here. Here it was more quiet, laid back, and little by little, I, I would. Uh, Kind of indicate to my mom that I wanted to, to spend more time down there. Sure. She was concerned, obviously, over uh, safety. Yeah, yeah. As a few years went by, my sister picked up and went. Okay. She went with my dad. Oh, wow. I stood with my mom. How much older was your sister? Crystal? I mean, pardon, uh, Carmen. Her name Carmen. is Carmen. Pardon me. My daughter's name is Crystal. Carmen was, uh, I think she's three, maybe four years old okay, at the okay, time. Okay, I see. Yeah, so yeah, she yeah. went to my, to my dad's, and I stood here. And maybe another few years later, then I started to spend a little bit more time. Sometimes I would go to school from there. Oh, okay, would okay. Take the bus and go to school from there. And eventually, I just liked it so much that I would switch it around. I'd spend most of the time there and come see my mom on weekends. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So that's where I really got an essence of, uh, of music because there was a lot more going on. There was music coming out of all the windows. I'm sure. Uh, you get a lot of congas and... and uh, and a lot of keyboards and people doing stuff out of their apartments. It was really exciting to wow, me. Wow, wow. And uh, I'd get less of it up here. Sure. So I started to, to spend more time down there. And I guess that's where I I started to get my love of music together. Yeah. Do you remember the first uh, song that kind of just completely, like, consumed you? Kind of tough to say because there were so many, so many of them. And initially... When, when my sister would want to go to a house party, and that was what was popular. It wasn't yeah. lounges, it wasn't clubs, it was For a house sure. party. Somebody did a, a house party in their apartment, and you would go and you'd basically dance and, and, and congregate with other folks, and it was really nice. So I would have to go, because my dad would tell my sister, if you want to go, you got to take him with you. <laughs> so I was kind of forced to listen to a lot of 70s stuff. At the time, I, I wasn't too crazy about it, but... As time went by, it, it had a big effect on me. Sure. So at then, I was listening to stuff like the Stylistics, okay, yeah, Temptations, yeah, yeah. Shy Lights, uh, Joe Batan, okay, yeah. Eddie Palmieri, sure. Hector Lavoe. So it was a mixture of all of that. And uh, as time went by, then I started to appreciate. So that was basically the groundwork for me to start to listen to music. And uh, 
at the time I, I loved the drums. Okay, I wanted yeah. to be a drummer, but we were too poor to take for me to take sure, lessons. Sure, sure, sure. But that always stayed in me, which affected me when I got my hands on a drum machine. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I had the ideas and I was able to do it with my hand. I just could not study it because we couldn't afford it at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever play conga or anything like that? No, no. No, okay. No, I played uh I played drums and, and most of the time I would take the quantization off so that I was playing live. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Which I, I see. did on a lot of K R S one stuff, things that, that uh that had a certain rhythm that you could not syncopate. Sure, sure, sure. So that's where I, I kind of became like a live drummer on a programming wow. drum machine. Wow. But a lot of that came from listening to those that music, and that music I still love today. Absolutely. And the, the rhythm is like nothing nothing else right. that you find James there, Brown, so. of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, back then there was an album that he released that had the letters Sex Machine across the front sure, in sure, red sure. letters. I know that And album. I think it was also said live in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. Well, that is considered the greatest up rock record. Up rock is uh, a style of dancing that was popular sure. in the 70s going on before breakdance, before sure, sure, all sure. that stuff. There was up rock, which was a one-on-one -on -one thing, a lot of hand motion, some splits here and there, but there was yeah. no spinning around on the floor. Yeah, okay. And up rock, the big songs were James Brown, uh, Give It Up or Turn It Loose, uh, Jimmy Castor, It's Just sure, Begun, sure, sure. Cool in the Gang, Love the Life You Live. And there was a gospel group, Stovall Sisters. They did a song called Hang On In There. Okay, okay, but okay. the rhythm of it made it an up rock record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Earth, Wind & Fire had a song called Moment of Truth. Okay, Very sure. funky. As long as the song was funky, it became an instant classic. I see, I see, yeah. So that was a lot of the stuff that I, that gave me the idea for rhythm. And then the uh, the stylistics and things like that gave me a lot of love for, for harmonies. Sure. And... Uh, and chords and things that made the music sound lush. Yeah, absolutely. Those are the groups that did that for me. But all of that came through hanging out with my sister, going to these house parties and, and a lot of outdoor parties, which they don't do anymore. Sure. There were sure. a lot of block parties. Sure. You don't see that much anymore. You close the block down. The whole entire block yep. would get closed. There'd be a little basketball court. Um, they'd give out free sandwiches, and but yeah. there would be somebody playing live music or a DJ. Wow, wow. Or a record shop that was nearby would come out and play. Sure. And you would hear all the classic songs there. Sure, wow. That, that was a big inspiration for me. Yeah, and there, there was a lot of that going on in Hell's oh, Kitchen, yeah. I imagine. Yeah, constantly. Right? It was it was the same as probably El Barrio. Sure. In El Barrio, you constantly, so you still go there, and you still hear it yeah. coming from here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's some parts of the Bronx, you can still exactly. see that, Exactly. Too. You still get that feel of, wow, you know, you can feel something's going on there. Yeah. That's how I was in Hell's Kitchen all the time. Okay, wow, all the time. wow, wow. So, go, going back to your, your mom and dad for a little bit, um, do you know much about either of their sides of the family? Um, where they might, because uh, I think I think from what I remember, you were born in San Juan. Is that right? Right. Okay. So do you know where they might? Did they live in San Juan like for multiple generations, or did they? Well, I know my life? dad was was born in Calle. Okay. Okay. Sure. And I believe my mom was born in Santurce. Oh. Uh, okay. Okay. I see. I, I, I because mean, again, since I was so little when we left, I didn't know much about their background. Yeah. Um. Trying to remember, my aunts talked to me a little bit about it because we all came. My aunts came, my uncle came, not with us, but sure. we all came and eventually yeah. got together. And uh, we, most of us, spend the rest of our lives here. My dad, my mom, my two aunts passed away. They grew up, and I still have an uncle that came here as well. Wow! All all lived in. All came from from Puerto Rico. Okay, and did they all all live kind of in the same area? Of New York, kind of or? in the same area, maybe a town away, but that was kind of the area they were from. But I know, but my father, I knew because they always called him Calle. Oh, his, his Spanish okay. buddies that would drink beers sure, and stuff sure, with sure. him, yeah. they would say Calle, yeah. and that's because that's where he was from. Okay, I, he was I see. he was born and raised there. Yeah, and uh, here he never left Hell's Kitchen, and now he's in a, an assisted facility, but he's still sharp. Yeah, he still remembers, and uh, and he he's now and then he'll 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 say something like, "You remember I came up in Calle?" I'm like, "Yeah, puppy, I know." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he'll he'll bring out these things. But my dad was Calle, mom I believe was Santurce, and. As far as the fan, I, like I never met my grandfather. If I sure. did, I don't remember. Sure, sure, sure. And I never met my grandmother. I see, I see. That yeah. part I don't know about. Yeah. And what when your when your aunts and uncles came to New York, did they live in Hell's Kitchen or or close to 82nd, 83rd well, Street? Well, when I came, when we came, my aunts came to my mother's house, which was 82nd. Okay, okay, yeah. And then shortly thereafter, my aunt, one of my two aunts, um, uh, her name was Titi Lola. She okay. went to. 98th Street and Lexington. 
Oh, and she okay. stood there. That's wow, where she went okay. from, from until she died. Sure. She lived on 98 in Lexington, and then my aunt gravitated to Hell's Kitchen as well. Okay, so I see. So my aunt sure. and my father were both in Hell's Kitchen, sure. and my mother was up here. But none in Brooklyn or the no, Bronx? No, they, or... they never left Manhattan. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, as time yeah, yeah. went by, I, I figured how lucky we were to be able to live in the city in the yeah. core because it was, it was difficult to find a place, and it was expensive. Absolutely, absolutely. My father really lucked out because he got a job at... Um, the Spanish daily news, El Diario. Oh, sure. And that was also very difficult. Wow. He didn't have an education here in the States. Yeah, and yeah, He's saying yeah. in like New York. He came from Puerto Rico, very little English. Yeah. And he landed that job, and that was a great That's job. That's amazing. It was a great... He, he did the, uh, I think, typesetting and some okay. other things. Wow. And uh, that was what he did. And my mom was basically taking care of us when we were there. And my aunt became a seamstress oh okay okay sure sure and then sure. my other aunt married and basically was a housewife with a couple of kids and her husband took care of everything from there on okay i see but we we're very disciplined like whenever i visited either of my aunts i couldn't speak english okay oh yeah. no no yeah 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 even by accident because if you said the same word twice yeah you, you get struck she, she'd <laughs> smack me like really hard and then she'd say i'm really sorry but you know i said oh i get it <laughs> yeah, i understand sure. totally for sure, absolutely. And um, that's how it was. And trouble was not allowed. Um, Hell's Kitchen, my aunt told me, you know very well, there's certain rules and you got to follow them. Yeah. On the occasion that I broke them, I paid for it. Absolutely. But it kept me out of trouble. And I never got arrested, never got in jail. I never had a problem. And my fear was letting them down. Yeah, absolutely. I and said, what, if I make a mistake and I let them down, not only is it hurt, but I'm going to pay for it. Yeah, you're going to pay for it. <laughs> you yeah, know, now, it, <laughs> now you can't do that, but it was very helpful to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Very beneficial. And were, were there other... Uh, women or just other adult figures in the neighborhood who who kind of uh, would would also keep an eye out oh, on. Oh no, you? the entire block. Yep, yep, yep. No, that's yep. how we were in Hell's Kitchen. For sure. Um, it's not existent today, but if I cross the street, I get grabbed by a neighbor by the ear and wow. brought right back to my aunt and say, "Your nephew, he was crossing the street, and I paid for it." <laughs> because they said, I'm giving you some leeway, you can't break the rules. Sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. So, no, everyone, everyone on the block was like either your uncle, your cousin. You could not do Absolutely. things, break windows, anything, because immediately they pick up a phone. Listen, your nephew, yep. your, your son, whatever, that's how it was. Word would get back faster. That's than right. Anything. And if I did something here with my mom and I was punished for it, she would call my aunt. Uh... So, there was a part two. So she would say, send them over. I want to talk to him. But that was the only time I wouldn't want to go. Oh, my God. But I had to go. That's you couldn't funny. escape it. Yeah, 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 Cause yeah. Because she would say, you know, if you don't show up, it's worse it's the next worse time. It's worse then. Yeah. So then I would have to do that. And, wow. uh But it was, uh, it was a good upbringing. Yeah, absolutely. It was a good upbringing. Women were actually the strongest people I knew. Absolutely. Much stronger than men. Absolutely. Much, yeah, much yeah, stronger. Yeah. It was women. It yeah. was my aunts and my, my mom and, and my sister. Wow, wow, wow. And my aunt's also from Puerto Rico and and old school, old school Puerto sure, Rico. Everything's sure. cooked fresh. Yeah. Nothing frozen. Yeah. Um, you had to be polite, open the door. You know, you, you just didn't cross certain lines. Absolutely. You did not. Absolutely. And since, since you mentioned food right now, what are some of the favorite things you remember uh, any of your family members cooking while you were growing up? Well, when you were sick, they did a thing called um, arroz con leche, which was a... a a rice that sat in a, in a in a bed of like milk. Sure, sure. And it made you feel better. Sure. So that was one. Um, of course, in the holidays, it was everything. It was uh, chicken, fish, yeah, pork, which I don't eat. That, sure. that was another battle when when I decided I don't want to eat anymore. My whole family went oh, crazy. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You know, because yeah, they're yeah. like, you have to. I said, no, I choose not to. Yeah. But that was big because they eat pork every holiday. Sure, sure, sure. Papeles. Um, I mean, oh yeah. Unless you make it with beef. Unless it's... you make it with beef or chicken yeah. and. That was tough. They after a few years they let they let it go, but they they were on me. Yeah. They thought something was wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm what's sure. going on? And you joined some kind of cult? I said, No, I just <laughs> it's very salty, it's just not good for your body. So yeah. I stopped it a long, long time ago. And um yeah, they would do that. They would do fresh pies, cakes, sure. uh, tembleque, which is coconut pudding. Oh of wow. course flan. Yeah. Uh bread pudding. Uh, rice, rice and beans, rice with gandules, which is the sure. yellow rice with gandules. Sure. And all of it was always fresh. And they wouldn't get their product from Hell's Kitchen. They would go to El Barrio. Oh, okay, okay. Or yeah. the Bronx. That, that, okay, yeah, yeah, Because yeah. that's where the two places where you had fresh you chicken get, and oh, everything okay. could get, you could get it right there. And in Hell's Kitchen, we had a few bakeries, but we didn't have like a slaughterhouse sure. or things like that. So they would go uptown to get it. Sure. But yeah, it was the, the basic, obviously, arroz con pollo, rice and chicken. Sure. Um, but the pateles, when when it came to that, yeah, deal, that huh? was that was really really good, and, and uh, 
Yeah, none of that stuff exists no more. I know. I but know. that was one of the things they would do, yeah. The, the holidays were a lot of fun, a lot of music. That was a nice thing, too. The music went on and on, like, to midnight, 1 o'clock. Sure. got to a point where I got too tired. <laughs> and they would just send me to bed and they keep and going. And they were still going, yeah. Yeah, and it was always wow. peaceful. Very peaceful and uh, very loving. Yeah, wow, wow Very, wow. very loving, very very supportive. Um, my aunts were extremely supportive. No matter what, they never they never turned their back on you. Yeah. They would say, listen, this yeah, is a mistake. This is the reason it's a mistake and you don't want to do this again. Wow. And I, I learned from that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A lot. And I, I try to share that with, with the kids I know and the, the people that grew up around me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as far as the neighborhood, I, either Hell's Kitchen or, or 82nd Street, the, the neighborhoods were concerned, um, what were there, what kinds of people lived in the neighborhoods at the time? Well, up here, there was a, a good amount of Latinos, which was at the time, when I was a kid, it was Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Okay, sure, sure. Then the sure. rest of the neighborhood was predominantly white with a little bit, a little bit of African American. Yeah. Hell's Kitchen was Irish, African American, and Puerto Rican. Very mixed, I guess. Huh? Very, and and like heavy, heavy. There was no such thing as racism. That was non-existent. Sure, sure. Non-existent. You, color had nothing to do with anything. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. These were my family or my friends, and it's still like that today, the ones that are still here. Sure. That, you know, as I grew and I saw all this racism stuff, it was actually mind-boggling to me, because I was like, what is this about? Because I grew up, my best friend is African American. Yeah. I have a friend that's Cuban. I have a friend that's Irish, and yeah. they're all just my friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was tough for me to understand for many years. But uh, it was, it was, yeah. It, Hell's Kitchen. I learned later when I got older and I started reading books that the Westies, which I knew who they were, I was a kid at the time. Sure. And they would always come by and pat us on the head, hey guys, or whatever. Yeah. And then I read years later they were cutting people's heads off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I said, yeah, wow, no I know this guy. Yeah. You know, and I know this guy. Yeah. I said, growing up, these guys were like, you know, look over. They looked out for the neighborhood. They looked out for the neighborhood. They looked over everyone. The <laughs> and then I remember there was some tracks in the back in, in 12th Avenue, 11th, and that's where they would find bodies. Wow. But as a wow. kid, I didn't know any of it. Sure, sure, sure. I didn't know any. I just knew, oh, these guys are from the neighborhood. Yeah. And then I saw movies, and I'm like, wait a minute, I know these guys. <laughs> Yeah, and I was like, "Wow, these guys were the ones that, uh, you know, were involved with mob stuff and all that." But sure. we knew them; they were very nice to all of us. They Absolutely. protected us. That was another thing about the neighborhood: you Absolutely. could not, you could not go in that neighborhood and do something yeah. to one of us. Man, y you could pay with your life. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, how yeah. serious it was. I've always learned to respect absolutely everyone, regardless of age, color, creed, because. You don't know who you're dealing with, and sure. I learned that in Hell's Kitchen. Sure, absolutely. You know, sadly, I ha I've seen people get murdered in front of me, right there in front of me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been blessed, and nothing ever happened to me or my family, but it's scary stuff because it's reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as years went by, and, and music and hip-hop mostly, where they talk about drive-bys and all this, I said, wow, where I grew up, there was no such thing. They came right up to you. Sure, absolutely. If you were really young, your fathers would come out and settle it. Wow. My father and your father. Yeah. When we got older, we settled it right there in the street. And yeah. when it was over, we shook hands and it was over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things now are much different. Yeah. You get murdered sure. from far More away. Anonymous. Things like that. But no, but we grew up, it was, you know, violence was very, very serious. And yeah. uh, you, you tried your best to stay away from it. Absolutely. And you learned from what you saw. Absolutely. You know, and I saw a lot, a lot. And, and I learned a lot of it. So we'll get into your some of the school uh, experience in a little bit. But just so I have a... Uh, reference as far as timeline. What years were you in high school? Ooh. Early, early 80s, I believe. Early 80s? Yeah. I believe it was early 80s. It's been so long. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was it was short. Reason reason being that I went to Martin Luther King High School when it opened. Oh, okay, okay. There were two light-skinned people. Me and a young Caucasian kid. Okay, okay, He sure. ate lunch in the principal's office. Oh, wow, yeah. That's how serious it was. So yeah. it's a predominantly black school. Sure. I didn't see it as a problem because I grew up in a neighborhood with Absolutely. blacks and everything. Absolutely. But I started having problems in the school. Okay, I started yeah. getting pushed into corners and, and, you know, people started to try to threaten me and sure. I kept saying, that's not a good idea. You're like, where I come from, this is not a good idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, it got to a point where I spoke to a few, few of my friends in the neighborhood that were older and yeah. they came to the school. Okay, and they settled. And huh? they settled everything. They said, you don't want to get near this guy. Yeah. You know, once that happened, um, I think some, a few letters got back to my mom. Sure. And we started talking about it and she goes, I don't want this problem. I don't want that problem. So I told her, let's make a deal. I said, let me leave the school 
and I'll get my GED in six months. Okay, sure, sure, sure. She let me leave. I got my GED in six months. Okay, wow. And moved wow, on, wow. and I went to college. Wow. I said, this situation's a little different. It's it's going to yeah. blow up at one point or other. I don't want that. Absolutely. And I go, I give you my word. It'll be done in six months. Absolutely. And I did it in six months. Wow. And then wow, I went wow. to I went to New York Tech. I went to play basketball there and to, to uh, study. Okay, okay. Sure, sure, sure. And I only lasted about a year because my music career took off. Yeah, yeah. So I had a choice. I was playing basketball on the team, and I was studying computer technology. And I said, wow, like, I went from a, a DJ that would DJ weddings and birthdays to, can you go on the road with me? Yeah, yeah. So I took that choice, and I never looked back. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. That's the only reason I didn't finish. I enjoyed it, but... Sure. And that, that the, the, I think from what I remember, the first the first time you went on the road was with Spider. Spider that right? D. That's right. Wow, wow, yes, wow. It's, it's really intense, and he called me at home. My mother said, there's a guy on the phone, and he said, can you go on the road with me, which to me was shocking because I didn't know what that meant. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, yeah I'm no, a, you know, I did you? a lot of DJing, but it, I never left New York. Sure, sure, sure. And we were going to, like, North Carolina, then South Carolina, and then you go to small clubs or big stadiums, and before you know it, I'm on the road. That's crazy. And that was the end of weddings and things of that nature. But that's the reason I left college. Otherwise, and in between all that, I still took two trade schools and completed them. Wow. One was Center for Media Arts as an sure, engineer. Sure, sure. And the other one was PSI, which was a Programming Systems Institute, all about computers, which okay. I finished as well. Wow, wow, wow. That's where I learned a lot about computer technology from the bottom, from, sure. from uh, binary numbers and and how they created uh, computers using metal donuts and winding them forward and backward wow. so they could turn on and off. Wow. So it's well before Windows. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's, yeah I did that's that as amazing. well. That's amazing. So, so yeah, but, but before we get more into school and eventually, you know, a lot more into, into music, one of the things that um, we, we were talking about just a second before we started uh, was uh, gangs in the neighborhood, and mm -hmm. I guess there were still, there were still, there were probably more um, if if you'd grown up maybe five, six years before that, at least at the timeline in Hell's Kitchen, it's like it was in the Bronx. But I imagine even when you were you were a teenager, there were still some gangs around. Is that right? There were there were gangs, um, maybe because of the relationship that people from Hell's Kitchen had with the city. Yeah, we didn't have gang shootouts. There was no sure. such thing. Sure. There was no accidentally struck by a bullet. Yeah. That didn't happen. I remember seeing the black spades often. They sure. would come in with their motorcycles, jackets, but they were kind to everyone, shake hands. Uh, uh, if there was an event, they would bring things to the event. Okay, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then there was always, always that the number one and two guy in Hell's Kitchen, usually sure. drug dealers. Sure. Very powerful. Sure. And they would come and pay respect to that person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And never a problem, but I was aware of them. Yeah. Now, that this this ties into something really interesting that I've never discussed. Uh, we were still kids. I wasn't into the whole gang concept, but the fact that you could put together a group of people sure. to do something was better than you by yourself. Absolutely. So yeah. I came up with, there were like four or five guys, and I came up with... Uh, something I called R-C-N-Y, which is in my early records. Okay, if you look at my credits, okay. it says mixed or whatever by DJ Doc R-C-N-Y. Okay. So R-C-N-Y stood for Rap Committee of New York. Oh. But it wasn't hip-hop rap. It was sure. rap like we're doing sure. here. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, hey, yeah, let me yeah. rap to you. Yeah. So initially, a few folks said, uh, is this a gang? I said, no, 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 no. No, we're about communities. Yeah. We're trying to get to know people. So we Absolutely. rap with people, get to know them, uh, basketball, bait, whatever it has to do with anything, yeah. we want to do it. Yeah. So RCNY was born in Hell's Kitchen, wow. and I still have a jacket that says RCNY Midtown on the back. Oh, that's amazing. When I do events in Hell's Kitchen, I still use the moniker RCNY, and I have a lot of supporters because we grew up there. Sure. But it was one of the first, I guess, institutions that was peaceful yeah. and successful that went from there, and then I ended up touring and making records, but it started with a handful of guys, like five of us, and it had to do with music, uh, sports, uh, meeting girls, of course, because yeah, we would go sure. do events. The girls would come over, we get to meet them. But and rapping has a lot to do with meeting right. girls. <laughs> but it was well before, well before hip hop or anything. Sure, sure, sure. The word rap meant let me rap yeah, to yeah, you, let, let me, me talk to you. to you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's what RCNY stood for. for but sure. that was my version of of those gangs. Absolutely. And we would try to find an empty basement, paint it, make it our own little place, wow. uh, play music there. Some people wrote poetry. It was whatever it had to do, but it was no violence. Yeah, sure, sure, There was sure. no crime, none of that. Yeah. That's where RCNY was born initially. Wow. Gosh. Do you remember around what time that was or how old you were? Late 70s. Late 70s, After yeah. 77. Something like that, yeah. 
yeah, probably somewhere mid to late 70s. Okay. That's amazing. And I kept it. And the only reason I dropped it on records because it started to take up a lot of room in the credits. Sure, sure. And then um, I adjusted it because there's a friend of mine that's like my brother. His name is Andrew Flores. Okay. His DJ name is A Flo. Okay, Andrew sure. Flores. So he would come to my events. He was from the Bronx. Okay, I was from okay. Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, yeah. But we, we, we got together really, really well. I met him through his best friend would play basketball. I was huge on basketball. Okay, my yeah. two loves were basketball and music. Sure. So I met his friend. We played really, really hard against each other and we had respect for each other. So then he came down and realized I play music and then he brought him down because ah. he wanted to be a DJ. He goes, I'm going to show you what a DJ really does. So he brought him down. So during a few events, he, Andrew would tell me, you know, your, your events always rock. They yeah. always rock. Yeah. He said they never, they never suck. They're never dead. There's always people. And he goes, and you have this energy when you spin. And he goes, so whenever you do an event, that event must rock. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's yeah. where this came from. Okay. Oh, must, must rock, rock productions, productions. Got it. Yeah. Which I, I, uh, I got, I got uh, patented and everything. You know, sure. I registered it. Came from Andrew Flores. Okay. It was wow. his invention. Wow. And for a while, it would say RCNY Mush Rock Productions. My uh, my publishing name is Mush Rock Productions. Mush Rock Productions. So sure. I, I, I let the, B, the RCNY go, even though I still support it. Sure. It was just so many others, but the word Mush Rock Productions came from him, and it makes total sense because whether it was a record, I'm working on production, or whatever I'm doing, it, it has rock. to be done a certain way. Sure. That's just my, my way of working, you know, my, my dedication. And he told me when you do stuff, it always rocks. It has to rock. Wow, that's where the word Mush Rock And he came up with it, Andrew Flores. Wow, wow. Mm -hmm. And he uses Mush Rock Mobile because he's still a DJ. Oh, okay, He's in Florida okay. right now, but wherever he goes, his logo is Mush Rock Mobile. Okay, sure, sure, sure. He handles the mobile division, which I used to do, but I got so busy I couldn't do this and that. I can't spin and then also produce and then also engineer. It's just too much. Sure, absolutely. So I st I've started to come out recently. I did the Puerto Rican Day Parade before the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And I did two summers in a row. I did just summer jams in Hell's Kitchen. Sure, And sure. I like to do that in Hell's Kitchen because it brings everyone back together. Absolutely. So that's a lot of fun, too. Absolutely. And I, I try my best to do that when I can. Absolutely. So um, let, let's take it back to, uh, to like, elementary school for mm. a little bit before we okay. before we keep moving forward. Which, which elementary school? I went school to school right up here. I went to Public School 9, which is still there. Okay, sure. It's on West 83rd Street and Columbus Avenue. Um... I, I even have some pictures, I think, somewhere at home where I have the little button-down shirt and okay, the yeah. hair cut to the side. And my mother and my father would take turns bringing me there. I went there. Initially, that's where I went to school before I moved on to William J. O'Shea, which was known as IS-44. Oh, okay. Which okay. is only like six blocks away. Sure, sure. And it was during that time that I left to Hell's Kitchen, and from Hell's Kitchen, I went to King. Oh, okay, okay. But yeah, Public School 9, PS9. Uh, now it's one of these new schools where it breaks the school into different portions and there's this one school here, but it's still there, okay, PS9. The bill, yeah, 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 I went to PS9 on West 83rd Street. I remember it very well. And, and what, what was it like there? Do you it remember? was nice. Um, clean cut. A lot of singing. Sure, okay. You know, I learned something there. This is off subject, but it still sticks with me today because when you walk through the streets... Sometimes you run into some people that are not so courteous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you're walking on the right side. Yeah. Now, I remember in public school, you would hold hands with a little girl. Yeah. And they would tell you, always walk on the right side. Yeah, yeah, I believe yeah. the entire country is that way. Yeah. So when persons are coming towards me, I'm like, the left side is completely open. <laughs> and then I said, maybe they didn't go to school here. <laughs> yeah. But in New York City, uh -huh. and like any other state, I'm pretty sure in the country, they teach you to walk on the right side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would always remember... They always told us to walk on the right side. Why yeah. do people have trouble walking on the right I know, side? I know. I think that same thing. It's, it's mind-boggling. I'm like, I know you went to kindergarten. Yeah. And it's yeah. always, they still do it today. You get the little kid, you hold hands, get on the right side. Yeah. Don't block the left. Absolutely. So that always takes me back to PS9. That's funny. I still remember my teacher. I can visualize her. Very sweet lady. And one traumatic moment I had during that time was I had to get my tonsils removed. Ooh. Because I would catch a lot of colds. I had a lot of allergies. And, uh... I remember getting them removed, and I remember my dad bringing me to school. He carried me that time, and I was, like, real sore and stuff. That always stood with me as well, wow. the time they removed my tonsils, and my dad brought me to school when I recovered. That sure. I remember, too. Sure, Absolutely. Yeah, those um, are good good times, except, you know, 
traumatic, but yeah. having him carry me and all that, that was that was very reassuring. Sure, mm -hmm. sure, absolutely. I remember that. Um, and uh, and yeah, did did you have any any like negative experiences in uh, either elementary or or inter intermediate school? Elementary, no. Elementary was fine. Intermediate, there was always that challenge. Yeah. And uh, by nature, I'm a very low profile person. Sure. I don't do a lot of interviews. I don't do a lot of. I, if, if it seems like it's going to be something good and it helps out, I'll do it. But I'm not big on, on hype. Yeah. yeah That's a yeah, whole yeah. other subject that I learned over life, and I learned in Hell's Kitchen. For sure. Real is real. A lot of fake stuff out there, but Absolutely. I deal with reality. I don't deal with hype, and and I'm not the the. I was always comfortable being the guy in the back. Sure. When sure. I was on stage, whatever I do, I'm okay in the back. I yeah. don't need the cameras. I don't need the lights. But you know what you do, and That's it doesn't it. matter for That's all that matters. Yeah. If you enjoy it, great. If you yeah. don't, I enjoy doing it. Yeah. So when I went to junior high, there were a lot of challenges. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. there's the bully, and then yeah. there's the, the real popular guy. And I'm like, why do I have issues when I'm the quietest guy in here? Sure. I don't, you know, like when I look now at, at those books where they say most likely to this or that, yeah. there's no way that Ivan Rodriguez from... That book became DJ Doc. No know. way, no way on earth, because that's not me. Yeah, you know absolutely. it. It kind of happened. Sure. You yeah. know, I noticed that a lot of guys, um, they have a background. They have a Tila Rock, sure. or a Grandmaster Kaz, sure. or a Curtis Blow, like Run DMC. Sure. Run was Curtis Blow's DJ. Sure. Before yeah, he yeah, became yeah. Run. So you had these. I didn't have any influence. I know you came from, from, literally from. It came. Yeah. The whole Doc thing had nothing to do with music. It had to do with Dr. J. Because okay, I loved sure, the, Julius right. Irving. Yeah, so yeah, much yeah. so that I named myself Doc because I loved him that much. And I still admire him immensely. Sure. But it had nothing to do with music. Uh, I didn't place it in the middle of my name. Yeah. The, the, the music industry did. Sure. I believe one time one of my credits ended up, instead of Ivan Rodriguez, it said Ivan Doc Rodriguez. Okay, yeah, And yeah, that yeah. stuck. Sure, sure. Uh, everyone that knows me calls me Doc. Sure. There was never the, le the letters DJ in front of my name. Okay, ever, sure, ever. sure, sure. Because to me, they were, too, they were just too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To yeah. me. Yeah. You know, there's people that have the name Grandmaster and this master yeah. and I, You're not for me. Doc. To yeah. each his own. Yeah, sure. It's beautiful. To each his own. But for me, Doc was plenty. My name Doc is here on my arm. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the only tattoo I have had in my life. And okay. it was Doc and then it's a Pink Panther. Sure, Because sure. growing up, I thought he was really slick. Yeah, he, he was yeah, always cool and absolutely. never got, got in trouble. Absolutely. Because I like this I guy. Mean, the, the music too is. Yes, I don't need the trouble. <laughs> I like this guy. So that's the reason I had this, but I never had a tattoo after that. But it was always Doc. And uh, if you run into anyone that knows me, you'll see them call out Doc. That's how you know they're my friends, okay, close friends. Sure, sure, if you sure. hear them call me DJ Doc, they're more of a supporter that don't yeah. know me personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or once in a while they'll say I've been Doc Rodriguez. They yeah. know me from music. Sure. But all my my close family and friends call me Doc. So that you would have never expected in intermediate school. Yeah. It was Ivan Rodriguez. I was the guy sitting in the corner in the back. And if you didn't see me, I was okay with that. Yeah, yeah. So sure. in intermediate school, getting back to that, um, there were some challenges. I was able to get past them. A lot of it had to do with Hell's Kitchen being raised there. You knew when you needed to step up and when you could just ignore it. Sure. So, sure. yeah, there was a few challenges. Um, soon as I started getting to sports and music, I could feel those challenges kind of back up. Yeah, yeah. And I, I didn't do anything to to make them back away. They just kind of backed away, Sure. which I was thankful for. Is that when you started playing basketball? I started playing school? basketball, I want to say 16. Okay, okay. And I only started playing because I was dating a girl that was really good at basketball. Oh, okay. And okay. I sucked. I never. Yeah. I would dribble with two hands. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and I would go support her and watch her play. I'm like, that is so cool. And she goes, why don't you like try to learn? Yeah. And I said, you know what? And this is how I am still till today. It's a gift. I'm thankful for it. But when I put my mind to something, if I like it, I'm going to learn it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you and I can talk about something. Oh, I do this. I'm like, I think I like that. Yeah. And I'll learn that. Yeah. So she told me you really should. And I literally, two hands. One year later, I was playing in the PAL, and and that season, I got most improved player. Wow, okay. It's like, okay. wow, this is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I've never been taller than six feet. I'm six feet, but I remember the first time I dunked. Sure. And it was all about excitement and, and, and that, that surge of energy. And I remember I played for Hell's Kitchen. We were the Clinton Cougars. I okay. think that year we went 29-1. and one. We, 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 we were really, really doing well. One of our guys was all city. He played for King. And I remember getting a fast break yeah. and one of the guys threw a bounce pass and I just caught it at the right spot and I sure. took off. Sure. When I took off, I just wanted to lay it up, but I noticed I was still up there. <laughs> and I can hear one of my guys go, 
uh, what was it he said? He said, dunk it, something like that. So I yeah. turned my hand opposite and I actually <laughs> dunked the ball in. And I said, oh wow. my God, like I can dunk. Yeah, yeah. And That's it amazing. was all that energy of, I'm going to get better at this. Sure. I ended up playing in college. I got drafted to Puerto Rico. Wow. And um, I took basketball very, very seriously. Absolutely. Like I did music. And it was because of the love of it. Sure. And it all came from that girl telling me, why don't you try? Wow. So that's always been that way. Whatever it is. Uh, a job, a, a project. Yeah. If I like the project, you win. Yeah. You're good because I'm going to take care of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I don't like the project, I'll tell you. Sure. You know, I've never taken money for something and say I'm not doing this. I don't want. I say, listen, I'm not too crazy about it. Yeah. I don't see it. But if you still want me to do it, I'll give it 100%. Sure. That's another sure. thing. Whenever I did uh, 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 Robert Sanchez, it was the same as Red Man or Method Man yeah. or Boogie Down. And I do the same for everyone. Yeah. No one's bigger or better or or, or deserves more. I sure. do the same for everyone. Sure, but sure, I'll always sure. tell you the truth. Yeah. That's hard to, to take sometimes, you know, the truth. But I will tell you the truth respectfully, but I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think that came from those little engagements in, in intermediate school in King sadly watching people die sure. um knowing this could be different but it's not yeah and uh, i took all of that and uh, i made the best i could of it and i'm still here yeah i'm a cancer survivor wow. i've been through a lot yeah. and um and i'm still here and i do the best i can but it all came i, I could say i wouldn't change a thing hell's kitchen it is in me it is who i am i grew up there and and you learn respect easily or you learned it the hard way. Sure. sure Man sure. or woman. You're going to learn it. You're going to, that's right. Though. You're going to learn it. When I hear people say, I'm going to learn you. Yeah. Trust me. I know what that means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I learned it in the streets and from my family. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I absolutely. learned. I could say that more than likely what I went through by today's standards would have probably been abuse. Yeah. I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. Because if they didn't keep me on that line, there's a handful of us left. A lot of my friends died of uh, drug overdoses. Sure. They died of AIDS because of sharing needles. I yeah. mean, kids. I, w I would see kids sticking needles in their arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these are my friends. Yeah. So if my aunts did not do, mostly my aunts, put me there and say, this you don't do. Sure. Um, I might have had a different outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I'm, I don't have any complaints about, man, my life. No, it was rough, but, but it was worth it. Made you who you there, are. There's a, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a scene I always tell folks that, that don't really know Hell's Kitchen. If you look at the original Exorcist, the movie, sure. there's a scene where the priest goes to visit his mother. Mm. He walks into a block. Yeah. It looks like it was hit by bombs. Yeah, yeah. I was there. Okay. There's kids sure. jumping on a car. Each one got $50 from yeah. for doing an extra work on jumping on the car. Most of those kids are dead now. I was, again, being shy. I didn't want to do so. I was across the street. So I'm sure. watching them jump on the car. But the thing is, when you look at that, you say, people couldn't have lived here. Yeah. I was living in the building in front of where those kids are jumping up and down. Wow. wow. That was 420 West 48th Street. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's just like when you see some pictures of parts of the Bronx from back in the day, right. too. I mean, Burnt out. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mattresses on the ground. And we would jump Darling on those too. mattresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, that's a perfect example of how, I wonder how it was like where Doc grew up. Watch The Exorcist. Okay. Watch when he walks down. After he leaves the train station, he talks to somebody, and then he walks. Okay, That's sure, sure, 48th sure. Street between 9th and 10th Avenue. Sure, wow. And it was, when I look at it, we didn't have heat. Okay, So my father would you. sacrifice his yeah. stuff for me and my sister, and he would freeze. Wow. Would you all, would you all, I've, I've heard in other instances of people who live in buildings like that, you know, every woman would go into the, the kitchen, they turn on the oven. Sure. And, and that, that's sure. how you survive in the Oh, when we moved there, yeah. there was no bathroom. Wow. The bathroom was outside. Okay. Our shower was next to the sink. Wow. So true, my true. sister would be cooking, and I'd be taking a shower in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. This is the reality. Absolutely. When you needed to use the bathroom, you looked out to see if the lock was off. If the yeah. lock was off, somebody's using it. Okay. Somebody from next door. Sure, sure. And then you would go in and close this little door and use the bathroom, and then they had the thing on the top with the with the thing you pull. Yeah. There yeah. was no bathroom in the apartment. Okay. Nope. Wow, wow, nope. wow. When there was no heat, there was nobody to call. Sure. There's no city number, no 311. Yeah. No, you froze. Yeah. Absolutely. Or you did the stove thing. Absolutely. That's how wow. it was. Wow, wow. That's how it was. The winters were brutal. I remember them well, and yet I wouldn't change them. Yeah. What about your mom's place? Was, was My mom's place was better. better. Luckily, up here, yeah. Upper West Side always got better treatment. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, there was very few times when there was a problem with heat or water or anything up here. Sure. There was always problems down. down. Whenever winter came, we knew. Yeah. Or instead of the, the oven, they would boil water. Huge. Oh, okay. The... the, 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 the 
the pans they would use for the holiday um, rice, okay, which was okay. huge. Yeah, 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 yeah. They'd make rice and the, that you'd fill that with water. Sure. And if you weren't feeling well, you'd put a teaspoon of Vicks inside the water, ah, vapor rub, okay. and turn it on, and so the kitchen great. will warm up, and you would be able to breathe better. Okay. Wow. Old school remedies. Wow. Wow. We did what we could. There was no assistance. Sure. There sure. just wasn't. I still remember our initial block parties. They would bring a trash dumpster, yeah. sort of clean, yeah. fill it with pump water, and we would swim in there. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, We sure. would swim in there. Sure. We didn't care. Yeah, absolutely. And then they had a program called Manpower. Manpower mm. would have job opportunities throughout the city, but they would also come to neighborhoods with these little lunch packets with cheese, ham, a little piece of bread, and a jello. Okay, okay. And give those out, and that was the best. Wow. Because that's all we could have. Sure, sure. So absolutely. all of that took me to the... the this whole the whole thing about hype decades later it just it doesn't work if you're not down to earth we we'll never we'll never gel yeah yeah i yeah, can yeah. tell a hype person and and again to each his own i'm not judging but i'm not about hype for sure it does nothing for me if you ever see me perform whether it's with a microphone i mean excuse me with a dj set or in a studio i don't touch microphones sure because sure. i have nothing to say sure everything i do i do with my hands yeah so, i don't need the, the the hype i don't need the microphone i don't need all those special effects wham, wham, yeah, or none of that none of that exists in my set yeah. because all of that is distractions absolutely having to do with hype absolutely if i can distract you then what i do with two turntables is not important yeah yeah, yeah. I don't have to have a skill. All I need to do is, is, is distract you and then put another record on. Yeah. It's play, popular. Play some sound effects. There you go. Bada bing, bada bing, or yeah. you, you let a record play, you put a digital delay on it, and then yeah. you let it delay out so there's no tempo. Then yeah. you put the next record. Yeah. Do respect. To me, that's cheesy. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's not, yeah, there's yeah. no skill in that. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't even know why they invented sync buttons on equipment. Why would you hit sync? The fun in doing it is doing it yourself. Yeah. yeah if you're yeah, going to hit yeah. sync buttons, a little kid could do it. Yeah, absolutely. There is no skill in that, but it is what it is. Absolutely. So, so since 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 you're you're bringing all this up now, let's let's get back to your your earliest experience uh, with DJ equipment because there's when we when we talked before all of this, I know you have some really interesting mm -hmm. stories about all of that. The inventions that you yeah, I mean, you literally no invented things. No choice. <laughs> yeah. I had to, we were broke. We were eating yeah. little ham sandwiches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would, you know, there's something I do, and this is all in straight honesty. When I go eat in, in some restaurants, if I order white rice and the rice is a bit bland, I put ketchup in it. Yeah, yeah. That came from being broke. Sure. Absolutely. I can afford it now. Yeah. But some habits die hard. Yeah. So I've had friends that go, ketchup? I'm like, you never struggled, did you? <laughs> I said, you, did you ever eat bread with ketchup in it? There was no hot dog. Yeah. Just, just ketchup. Bread, ketchup, yeah. I said, that's real. That's what they call real. Yeah. When you don't have enough and you break it in half and you give half to your sister or to your friend. Yeah. So I will still put ketchup at a time because it takes me back. And I'm like, wow, this tastes good. <laughs> because that's <laughs> yeah. all I had. For sure. Um, so when it came to the, the, the DJ thing, one of those events where my sister had to go out. And, you know, I feel kind of bad now because I used to pick on her and, and you know, sure. you pick on your sister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my father says, you don't, he don't go, you don't go. Yeah. So she took me. So she took me to a place with her and it was called the Ice Palace. Okay, okay. Gorgeous. Yeah. I've never forgotten it. It was based inside an ice skating rink on 30, I think 32nd or 33rd and I want to say 11th or 10th Avenue. And it was a really weird building that's still there that goes up like a V. Oh, okay, Like an upside okay. down sure, V. And at sure. the top was... A, um, a roller skate, an ice skating rink. Wow. They would temporarily build a dance floor in the middle of the rink and then two little sets of stairs. It was so cool. Yeah. They had water beds on, on the balcony <laughs> so that you could listen to music and just bounce around in the water bed That's and look so at the cool. stars. It was so cool. And I was a young kid. So I got in with a fake ID and I was excited but nervous because I was like, they're going to catch me. I'm like, yeah. I don't even have a mustache. Yeah. And I remember clearly when we went in, Everybody's looking at things that I get caught on this bass, this heavy, heavy bass. I'm yeah. like, ooh, kind of made my, my skin crawl. And I kept walking in and I saw a window on a wall. And in the window, you could see a guy with headphones on. Sure. And I'm like, he's probably the guy playing the music. My first time in the club. Yeah. And he was playing MFSB, Love is the Message. Ah, okay. And I don't know. It just came over me. And I told my sister, I want to do what that guy's doing. Yeah. And she goes, what are you talking about? She's there. She's having a good time. What do you, I said, I want to do what that guy's doing. Yeah. Whatever it is, I want to do it. Like I said to you, sure. if I like it. And uh, the very next morning, I had to talk with my dad. I said, puppy, this this, this thing the, the uses two turntables. And 
and and we didn't have money like that. Yeah, yeah. So when I wanted to do it, there were no mixers. Sure. You could not go to Best Buy or Guitar Center or Sam Ash or the mom and pop store and sure. buy something with two volume controls. Yeah, yeah, Didn't yeah. exist. Yeah. So when, when people say, uh, be thankful for the pioneers before you. Yeah. Including hip hop guys, rock and roll guys. Absolutely, yeah. Elvis owed a lot to people before him. Sure. Respect them. You may not agree with them. You may not even like them. But yeah. respect that they did it and it permitted you to do it. Absolutely. So when I did it, um, the battle was A, I don't know what I'm doing. B, I can't afford it. Yeah. C, if I could afford it, it doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. So I said, well, how can you make go from one record to another and you don't have a source? Two receivers. Sure. Two independent receivers, which means you need four speakers. So there were two speakers on one, two speakers on the other. That... I got past that challenge. Now, the turntables, no pitch control. Wow. No, you can't buy a turntable with pitch control. Sure. They didn't exist. So I said, um, there's only one way to do it. Drop the needle at a point where both rhythms are similar and at the right time. Wow. Years later, I understand that was called needle dropping. Yeah. I was doing that as, as a 14, 15 year old kid. I didn't know what it was called. Sure. I just know it was the only way I can get the needles to work and if I couldn't cue I would bring my ear close to it and listen for the little sizzle uh, and I knew that was the, the high end snare it wasn't the one it was the two sure. so if something went I knew that was the snare and that's where I would time it wow. it was excruciating hard I'm sure and I'm um, sure. once it was in the right place I'd grab one volume on the receiver start to bring it up bring down the other one and I said wow it worked Yeah. it was wow. so cool it worked and that's how I started no mixer Two sets of receivers, two sets of speakers, and then it came to a point where I wanted something a little better, but I couldn't afford it. Sure. So I made my own speaker. My friend Andrew Flores still talks about it today okay, yeah. because I was a kid. I yeah. didn't know anything about impedance, resistance, sure. voltage, current. I knew nothing. You're what, 13, 12, 13? 14, 15. Oh, 14? Okay, wow, wow. Um, yeah. And I said, well, I always like to mess with tools, so I got five pieces of wood that I found in the lumber yard. There used yeah. to be a lot of lumber yards in Hell's Kitchen and they would throw a bunch of wood away. Sure. So we'd go get the wood. On the way to get the wood, we would run over to the breading place and steal bread. You could <laughs> yeah, smell sure. the bread for, for blocks. Sure, sure, and sure. And as soon as they went back in to do something, we'd all grab a loaf and run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we did. And uh, I took the wood, cut it into five pieces. The box came out pretty darn good and then the top was the catch. Okay, yeah. This is where the speakers are going to go. So... I got together a bunch of car speakers that were thrown away or were very, very cheap at like Canal Street or something. And I think I put like eight speakers in there. I had no clue that, that resistance, <laughs> impedance was important. I sure. just wired them. Sure. And that was uh, late December. And I remember one of my friends was a landlord, uh, was a, a, a super in a building next to ours that she said, listen, this apartment is empty. The tenant left and it's going to be empty for about a week. Okay. Want to do a party? I said, can we do a New Year's party? She said, yeah. So we went in there. I hung the speaker up. I put hooks in it. I hung it up. We couldn't afford lights, so I put an umbrella upside down. I put Christmas lights in it. Sure. Those are, those are my disco lights. And we started at like 12.10. After we said Happy New Year with the family, we went in there, and I played music till the next day till 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And that was, that was it. That was like, for me, it was amazing. Yeah. And that, yet we're still with very primitive equipment sure, sure way before Newmark and Gemini made it accessible absolutely, absolutely but that was that was a big deal because that also taught me to do things that I did in studios sure. and and in other issues with, with uh, music that I would have never thought of absolutely I would have never thought of because everything came too simple yeah you buy stuff now and you hit a few buttons but what happens if those buttons aren't there? Absolutely. Or if one of them goes bad. But you had to learn to do all the work. You had to learn to own. do it and, and, and when it worked you knew I'm good at this. I, yeah. I can I can do this, yeah. and I did a lot of that in studios as well. I came up with ways to make things sound a certain way sure. when it seemed like you couldn't do it. Wow. So so what what are some of the some of the kinds of records that you were uh, spinning at this time, if you remember? All 45s. Sure. No albums. Sure, sure, sure. If you ever listen to, I did an album with with uh, uh, an artist by the name of Lord Shafiq. The oh album yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sure. called The Chosen One. Sure. There's a song on it called Robo Doc. Okay. Um, the lyrics are true. He talks about how I would walk into a record store with a really big coat on yeah. and walk out with 45s in my pocket. Sure, sure, Again, sure. 
broke. Absolutely. You and uh, I'm not proud of it, but it, it yeah, is what happened absolutely. at the time. And I told him, if you're going to say it, say the truth. Yeah. So I would go into a record store, and if I could, I'd take a few 45s, and th that was my source, sure. 45s. Sure. There were no 12 inches. Sure, there sure, was only sure. albums and 45s. Albums were too expensive. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you would take a 45 and basically go back and forth with two 45s. Yeah. So back then, wow. Atco had a group called Sons of Robin Stone. They had a big record called Got to Get You Back. That was one of the singles. Sure. A lot of Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five. Yeah. Uh, Hum Along and Dance was a huge okay, club yeah, song sure, at the sure. time. Uh, a lot of uh, underground groups, Executive Suite, Main Ingredient towards the beginning. A lot of R&B soul, some up rock like Just Begun. Sure. But all 45s, um, a lot of disco music. And that's another huge thing that people know me for hip hop and I had nothing to do with hip hop. Yeah. I didn't care about hip hop. Sure. My music was R and B soul, classic soul and yeah. disco. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I came up on absolutely. and that's something I still enjoy when I want to listen to music. Absolutely. But when I did hip hop and I got a taste for what it did, I said, I like this. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I put my mind to it and I became very, very good at it. Do you remember do you remember what year you you for, I mean obviously it wasn't even called hip hop for a long time but what year you kind of first knew of this kind of music? I would say late, late 70s, I think 79, maybe 80, when Grandmaster Kaz and groups like that would be on independent labels, and I would sure. hear them, Sure. Um, and they were okay, they were nice, some of them would make me move my head because of the yeah. rhythm, I'm very rhythmic. Yeah. If they didn't make my head move, I said, it really doesn't matter to me sure. who they are. If it doesn't make me move, I don't like it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah and yeah. Um, I remember those kind of songs, I remember when Fatback Band did a song and they were like the first commercial record with rhyming on it. Okay. It's sure, called King sure. Tim the Third. Sure. There's a rhyme in the song. Okay. That was the first physical record I believe ever came out with rhyming. With rhyming on it, I see. I Even see. though they weren't rappers. Sure. But sure. they rhymed on it. And of course in the twenties and thirties and all you know, there was their own version of rapping. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. uh those were the ones I heard. I didn't play them too much and I never wanted any live artists hip-hop artists to touch my microphone yeah, sure, sure, because sure. they would destroy my set yeah. they would be too loud and I'm, I'm big on quality so I would say that's the only reason not because you're good or not good it's because you're out of control yeah, yeah you, you yeah, know yeah. and that was another thing I learned to, to teach a lot of the artists I work with when we sure. were in the studio keep a certain level of control you don't have to scream unless it, it's required yeah so yeah. those all those all things came from you know from the from the having to invent things coming up but all, all 45s I still have a really really great collection of 45s wow. in, in my in my studio and uh, eventually albums which was tough to buy two albums sure that was sure. tough because it was expensive absolutely and then imports came in which made it even worse imports were like twice the price of an album so but it was 45s a lot of disco some R&B so I would play rock and roll that okay. was part of my set sure, I would sure, play sure. I would play Bill Haley okay, I yeah. would play um the, the twist, uh, I would play a little bit of, of, of twist related Elvis, like sure. Blue Suede Shoes or something, and they always loved it because it took some certain people back. Yeah, 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 yeah um, absolutely. I enjoyed Frank Sinatra a lot, I still do. Sure. Um, Etta James, I, I love I love all types of music. Absolutely. But if you told me hip hop, I would say, eh. Yeah. Which is odd. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I, I, I really, okay, I enjoyed it, and when I do it, I, I, um, I do it very, very well. Absolutely. But if they told me, you know, if you had to take music with you, it'd be classic soul. Yeah, yeah. If I had yeah. to go and it That's was only one choice, on. it would be classic soul. Yeah, for sure. It would be classic soul all the way. For sure. I still take my daughter to the to the Beacon Theater for Valentine's Day to see the stylistics, wow. the phonics. So my daughter knows all the songs. That's wonderful. And I tell her, you can love what you love. I said, but listen to these people. Yeah. Look at what they do. Listen to the chords, the violins. Yeah. Whenever yeah, they yeah. bring strings, I said, oh, this is going to be great. She goes, yeah. why? I said, they have strings. Yeah. There's live strings. I said, that's huge. That is huge. That's what made Motown huge, when they added strings. For sure. Before strings, it was, ah, eh. when they added strings, like, whoa. The sound just... It threw it up. Yeah. Strings yeah, yeah, a bit. Yeah. So, yeah. Anything with beautiful strings, lush. Oh, I love stuff like that. Yeah. And that's sure. what I tried to do with hip hop. I tried to make it lush. Absolutely. I used a lot of panning. I used doubling. I, I did things that didn't exist. Sure. Not sure, in sure. hip hop. They existed sure. in rock and soul and, and folk music, but they didn't exist in hip hop. Sure. Absolutely. Hip hop was kind of monotone. Sure. You know, the, the, the audio never made you go, oh, what was that? Yeah. And I, I kind of invented that and I said, I'm going to make this exciting. Yeah. So I like to make hip hop songs exciting. Not only the artists, but 
the experience, especially when you put headphones on. Oh, absolutely. Any absolutely. records I do, listen to headphones, and you go, wow, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't hear that in the car or, or here or there. Sure. And, uh, and I remember when I met DJ Scratch, which to me is my favorite hip-hop DJ of all time. Yeah. I told him, you're, you're pretty amazing. I told him, I'm going to make you more amazing. I yeah. said, I'm going to do things to what you do that no one's ever done before yeah. because you deserve it. Sure. And he and I have a great relationship, and it's always from the beginning, from when he very, very first started, and we did his cuts, and I said, okay, now let me work on them. Yeah. And when he would hear the mix, it's like, wow. wow. I said, well, that's what you do, but now it's, it stands out. It doesn't have to be in the back. Sure, sure. And it doesn't overpower, but it, it has enough where you go, wow. Like, the cut moved from there to there, here, there. And then it's, I really enjoyed doing that for Scratch. Absolutely. I really did. Absolutely. I would do it for, for, for uh, Cutmaster Cool V as well. For Biz, I sure. would do that for Cool V. Sure. Because I, I worked with them as well. But being a DJ, I guess, you know, I lean towards making sure that people notice them. Absolutely. Because they've over time they got lost. Sure. DJs got lost. Sure. You know, they they just people didn't really understand how important they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I guess like like you said, when as as the technology evolved and things became simpler, mm -hmm. you 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 didn't necessarily have to uh, have someone with a whole lot of skill nope. as a as a DJ sometimes. No, nope. it's it's. It's a totally different world. Um, expensive records are not a problem because you rip them off from the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Creating mixes doesn't matter because you hit a sync button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so go, going back to records for a little bit, what what are some of the stores that you would um, get the 45s from on a regular basis, if you remember? Colony Records was one. Okay. That was on 49th Street and Broadway. As you walked west, Sam Ash, I mean, Sam Goody was there. Oh, okay, okay. Sure, Many people sure, don't sure. remember. Eric Sermon mentioned Sam Goody in some of his rhymes. Sam Goody was there. Yeah. I went into Sam Goody. Of course, I went to Rock and Soul, which is still around. Sure. Um, a good friend of mine owned a record store in Park Place. His name was Frank Ramos. And then he moved uptown to the Midtown area. I went to his store. I went to... The really famous store was Downstairs Records, which was in the train station on 42nd Street. Okay, sure, sure, And you sure. go right down, and they had a lot of 45s yeah. accessible because they were right there. Sure. Colony always had them behind a wall, so you'd have to ask for them. <laughs> yeah, a little more difficult. Yeah, a little more difficult, but, but yeah. um, Downstairs Records had them right in front. So it was Downstairs. Um, there were a couple of mom-and-pop stores on 8th Avenue. There was Frank's store. There was Rock and Soul, which has moved a couple of times. But as I said, they're still there now. They're still doing it. And uh, and J and R Music World. Oh, okay. okay J and R sure. Music World had great, great selection of music. They had a beautiful GLI system set up, and they would have a live DJ. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Those were mostly the places I would shop. And then every now and then, when uh, Columbia would have one of those sales where they go buy eight records for a dollar. Sure. You would do that. Absolutely. Finish your commitment, quit, and then do it again. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure they were they were curious. Why was he ordering the same record twice? Because I needed two of them. Of course. So I yeah, would yeah, do yeah. that with, with albums with Columbia. Yep. Wow. Anything, wow. any hustle you could do to get the records. I'm like, for okay, sure. I'll buy eight records for a dollar. For sure. I'll pay whatever you need me, and I'll quit. Yeah. After a while, they say, yeah, we don't need you anymore. <laughs> but that's what I would do. Were, were there were there any other people in your neighborhood around your age who had a huge record collection as well that you remember? There was a guy. Oh much older gentleman that was a counselor he would help us out he owned two turntables but he was very very protective of them uh, he never permitted anyone to touch them and i remember i was like like a puppy looking at food say damn i'm hungry yeah but i was never um i'm not a forward type of person aggressive so i sure. wasn't gonna ask if he sure. didn't tell me would you like to i wouldn't and he never did okay and i always remembered that and i said i'll wait yeah i'll yeah. wait till it's my time yeah but he had two they weren't 1200s or anything like that. They yeah. were, but they were two turntables, and sure. I would look at them and go, "Wow, um, I wonder what he does with them." Because I don't think he did. And he had a few records, but I could say that when I started and I took it very seriously, a lot of DJs emerged in Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, yeah. After yeah. that, which which they you know they openly admit you know Doc was the person that that got me interested, and in. I think still today. Sure. Some of them do it as a hobby, but they do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. do it, and, and it's nice to know that they, they you know, because before me, there were no DJs in Hell's Kitchen. Sure. Hell's Kitchen, we had Lisa Lisa. She grew up with us. She's, okay. she's a good friend of ours. She's from the neighborhood. We had some boxers, uh, some basketball players. 
a lot of musicians, a lot of Latin musicians sure, that sure. would meet with guys from the barrio and play salsa. Um, the, the Chita was in my neighborhood, which was okay. the most yeah, famous yeah. Latin place in the world. Wow. The Pani All Stars played there. The Chita was on, I believe, I believe 54th Street. Sure. But DJs, no. I was the first one to come, and then when they saw that you can actually do this, if Doc can do it, so there was a lot. A lot of them fell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they yeah. oh, this is too much work. Yeah, for sure. Um, I remember this is a really funny story, and I try to help a guy out, but again, some people take things the wrong way. I was spinning outdoors in Hell's Kitchen. I always went to the shade. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Always to the shade. Sure. So one of my neighborhood guys, he was like a, a week later, he was a DJ. I was like, okay. <laughs> he sets up across the street. I said, you really shouldn't set up across the street. What are you talking about? I know what I'm doing. I'm like, you're under the sun. Yeah. You don't want to be under the sun. Yeah. Why? Okay, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> Dude, 20 you minutes want? later, his needle's wobbling like this. And he goes, what the hell? I said, I told you, you're under the sun. Your uh -huh. records are melting. Uh -huh. Oh, damn. I said, it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it requires some common sense. For sure. I think after that, he quit. <laughs> but I, I told him, don't play under the sun. Yeah. Come to the side I'm on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, under the sun, is, it looked like hills. Oh, my God. And it was just hilarious <laughs> because I told him yeah, in advance. Sure. So That's you true. can't play what, what vinyl under the sun. Absolutely. It'll yeah. melt. And he learned it the hard way. Absolutely. Wow. And that was it for him. He was one of the ones that said, ah, I'm not in this. Wow. And there's still a handful. One of them is in Florida. There's a couple in New York. But they came in after me, and they also came to a lot of my events. Sure, sure. And then they went on, on their own and did did their own thing, and it's pretty cool. That Yeah, very very cool. So obviously, obviously there were a lot of block parties in the Hell's Kitchen. Uh, neighborhood that you uh, DJ'd at or attended. Mm -hmm. What about in other parts of New York? Did you go to many of the block parties or, or parties that were out, out in the parks in the Bronx? Oh, or, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. went to the Bronx. I went to El Barrio. Sure. I went to some in Brooklyn. Yeah. I mean, they were really nice. There was Violence wasn't a thing. You didn't concern sure. yourself with violence. You went to hear... Like, there were guys that went to meet women. Sure. Guys like me went to hear records. Yeah. Let yeah. me see what this neighborhood's playing that maybe I don't know about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is what you did in clubs, too. But in the block parties and in private parties, they would take a magic marker and black out the label. Sure, sure, So you sure. could, there was no Shazam. Yeah, yeah. You know, you would try to remember and hum it to the guy at the record store. Oh, it goes like this. Oh, I know what that is. And I met a guy at the time. His name is Albert Marrero. He's probably one of the greatest in New York City. He's still alive. He's still with us. And he worked at Rock and Soul and uh, many other stores. And he was the source. Wow. All I'd have to do is call him, hey, Albert, it sounds like this. And I would hum and he'd go, that's the dramatics. That's amazing. That's this. That's that. He's an amazing, amazing guy. Wow. He was one of my sources. But um, I would go to parties in the Bronx. The Bronx parties were always what they call spicy. They were always really sure. good and, sure. and, and a lot of energy. And that's where Andrew Flores is from. Sure. So right. he would love for me to go up there because he would kind of throw me in there. He'd let my guy play for a little while. Yeah, yeah. And then he'd have that look on his face like, watch what, what happens when they hear him. Yeah. Because I, I, I did everything at another level. Sure, sure, It, sure. it was like very concentrated and, and, uh, and it had to be right. Yeah. So yeah. he always got a kick out of that. Now, there's a thing in New York City that's been around, gosh, it's got to be at least 40 years. It's called the 9th Avenue International Food Festival. Mm. It hasn't happened in two years because of a pandemic, but it happens every summer in May. I believe this year is the 14th and the 15th, something like that. Yeah. Well, I was there when it started, wow. the very first one. So I would go onto 9th Avenue, and whoever had an apartment with a fire escape to face the avenue, yeah. I would ask their mother, can I set up here? Can sure. I play music from here? Oh, my God, those experiences are amazing because when I would start playing, you couldn't get through the block. <laughs> so there was one entire block. <laughs> where you could not pass because wow. everybody's dancing in there. So and then the police there knew us. It wasn't like like what they're trying to do now with, with policing and getting to know. We knew the cops. Yeah, we knew all course. the cops yeah, from yeah, Hell's yeah. Kitchen, from the precinct. Yeah. So they wouldn't get mad. They'd just look up at me and go, Ivan, because they would call me Ivan. Sure. People can't get through. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, could yeah. you pause it? Like, they wouldn't say stop or take my equipment. Sure, sure. But as I started in that festival, and I think I did it three years in a row before they started with the permits, Okay. And what we did the third year, when the police, there were some new cops, they said, you're going to have to shut it down. So I went from 50th and 9th, we went around 49th Street, that's Printing High School. Mm. We opened up a pole, yeah. set up there, and half the block okay. filled <laughs> Printing High School yard. Mm. And we just kept jamming there wow. till about 8 at night. Wow. We decided the next year, it was so good, let's do a tournament. Let's do sure. music, a basketball tournament, a handball tournament. And um, 
a stickball tournament. Sure. And all the neighborhood, including the guys that would sell drugs, chipped yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. We bought trophies. This is all us. This yeah, is like that sure. RCNY thing. I said, sure. let's do something that's exciting. That, yeah. And they would come. And then there was a dance hustle dance contest. And believe it or not, it was won by two guys. Okay. Because okay. one of the guys was a good leader, but he knew how to follow. Okay. Better than a woman. Yeah, yeah. So they went and danced and they made it to the final and they won. It was hilarious. Wow. It's like, wow. look at this, how cool this is. Yeah. These guys know how to dance so well, they were able to beat a traditional couple. Wow. And then we had the three on three tournament. They won their trophies. And we did all of this just for fun. Wow. Yeah. So there, there, there's a lot you brought up just in, in that story that I. Am, am curious about and since the last thing you mentioned was the hustle were, were there were there some big hustle uh, competition teams that were out of Hell's Kitchen Hell's Kitchen had great dancers individual dancers but the Bronx yeah the Bronx was it no the Bronx was it hands down yeah, yeah the yeah. Bronx I, I, I my friend Andy was from the Bronx he hustled very well and he introduced me to Eddie and Lourdes Eddie and Lourdes I think they were on Star Search yeah 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 they were the best yeah. the absolute best I know Eddie way before that when he would come to a house party with Lourdes sure. and he would spin her like he would do <laughs> and her hand would break a lamp <laughs> and they just keep going they this is how going. how far back I go with yeah. this stuff where, where they go you know did you know this I, I was there in the beginning yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw Eddie and Lourdes doing these things wow. I knew Floyd which sadly passed away recently and Floyd was another pioneer in hustle music sure. um Oh my gosh, so many of, of the greatest, absolute greatest, were from the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So much flair, so much style. And I think in salsa, it's the same thing. Bronx sure. dancers are amazing. For amazing, sure. amazing. Uh, on, they call it on two dancers. But the Bronx, they led the way when it came to hustle dancing. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. there's still hustle events in New York once in a while, and it's always the Bronx guys. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think Willie's putting together... 50th anniversary celebration. He does cruises. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. He mentioned it to me, but yeah, the, the, the Bronx guys, absolutely, and the women as well. I mean, yeah. they invented that whole thing of throwing the girl in the air and spinning her around like like, yes. like, like a snake around their necks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, one, one thing Willie, Willie told me about, you know, in the early days as the hustle was was coming about, he said, it, you know, one of the one of the biggest places for them, of course, was the hooky parties. Oh, yeah. Um, did, were, were, were hooky parties a big thing in Hell's oh. Kitchen? Well, not in Hell's Kitchen because we have a location, but I sure. used to do them. Sure, sure, I sure. I still have a flyer, and in order to kind of, like, fool the, the, the police or the, or the school, yeah. I would, my flyer had a fish hook and then a key, a door key. <laughs> and it would say, today's hook key party. Yes. <laughs> and we did them in in in, um, in a roller rink in the Bronx. Wow. Okay. Oh, Always. Wow. We would wow. go to the Bronx to sure, do it. Sure, sure. Yeah. Wait. Wait. Which ro which roller oh, rink? Oh gosh. Do you remember? Name is on the tip of my tongue. It's it's on it's on. Uh, what's that highway that has a, a overpass? That that part of the Bronx. Uh, was it, it the the Major Deegan? Is that no, no. It's no, okay. Uh, the Bruckner. Bruckner. The Bruckner. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the, the Bruckner. Bruckner. There, there was a rink. I forgot the name of it, but it's right on the Bruckner. Oh, okay, okay. okay. That was the rink. I I, the name's on the tip of my tongue, but that's where we would do it, and it was hook key. I'm sure I still have a few <laughs> flyers, and it was the way we would keep people from knowing what it, you know, the older folks, and it sure. would get jam-packed. I think we charged like five bucks at the door. Wow, 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 yeah. And um, we would do, you could roller skate. It was huge. Yeah. And you could hustle. Wow. Um, it was so cool. Yeah, we used to do hooky parties. Hooky parties were a huge deal. Yeah. Huge. And at the same time, no drugs. Sure. No violence. Sure. None of that. None of that. None Absolutely. of that existed. It was always nice and people had a great time and they always showed up for the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah hooky yeah. parties. Big deal. Hooky parties, for big sure. Big deal. Yep. And you also mentioned handball. Uh, was handball a big thing? And... Huge. Yeah. And again, the Bronx. Yeah. The Bronx. I, <laughs> I used to go up there and watch this guy. He only had one arm. Okay, okay. He's amazing. Anybody that plays handball in New York knows him. I don't know his name, but I used to go up there. Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Go watch him in Yankee Stadium. And the handball courts out there. We had handball, um, handball down in the village. The village was really popular for handball. Um, in, the, in the other areas, we would do it for fun. Yeah. I played it, but I wasn't uh, that and paddleball. Yeah, paddleball. But the real guys... Yankee Stadium. Yeah, 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 yeah. They they, they, they did away with most of the courts. There yeah. Now. They, matter of fact, they got rid of. They I think it became a parking lot. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. There's maybe one or two left. Yeah, but. yeah. Handball was huge, yeah. huge, huge. Yeah. And and also Coney Island or or, or um or the, the the beach up there in in the Bronx. They they oh, have Orchard Beach. Orchard for Beach. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or um, any of those beaches. They had handball courts. That's where it was. Absolutely. That and basketball. Absolutely. Under yeah, the yeah. sun. 
thousand yeah. degrees. <laughs> That's how you knew you were gung ho. Yeah, and yep. so so you already mentioned you 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 play basketball around the Bronx too. I played ball in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah I played yeah, I in mean, everywhere. I'm sure. I played in Christ the King. My friend Andrew Flores brought me out there. I played out in the street park with them. Um, in New York City, I played all over here. Sure. Um, and it, even after, when I when I finished playing in school and all, I got a, a handful of guys together and we joined the the Seven Up Hoop It Up, which was on TV, uh, and we okay. won that. Wow. We won the, the division in New York, and then we went to Philadelphia and won the whole thing and get this little crappy trophy. <laughs> but the memories were great. For sure. And we won it. For yeah, sure. we won it. Me and my pal. One of my my guys playing was a guy from the studio that I met because I played ball with with artists as well. I okay. play with I play with EPMD, wow. Ed OG, and the Bulldogs because sure. they start to talk crap. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, like I play a little see. basketball. Let's I said, we, I play a little. I might not be as tall as you. I said, but I play a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And of course, when we played, then it was a different story. <laughs> but yeah, I play with Eric and Parrish, and they're big. Yeah. Eric and Parrish are big. You know. Okay. Yeah. Sure, um, sure. I think Redman may have played. Um, Biz didn't play. Biz mm. wasn't really into athletic, but I think Cool V might have. Yeah, matter of fact, Cool V did play. We played in, in Hackensack, New Jersey. After I would work on the album, we would go to the park and play. Yes, yes, he wow. did play. Um, and a lot of hip hop guys, uh, Ed OG, with the guys came from Boston. Sure. We'd have a blast with them because they have that accent. Yeah. So if, if yeah. we needed a record and he'd say it's in the car, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> what are you talking about? I yeah. don't know what that is. I said, yeah. there's an R. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we would have that kind of fun, but I got along with all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had a great relationship. Most of the guys that I ever made records with, all girls, Light, Latifah, um, we're, we're best of friends. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're best of friends because I treat them all with respect. Absolutely. That's it. But. Yeah, handball we played and, and uh, basketball. Basketball for me was whoever, whenever. Sure. I'd get wake like someone would come in my house in the morning and knock. My father would be like, there's somebody at the door. Doc, there's this guy. He's like 6'3". I said, I'll be right there. <laughs> and I'd brush my teeth, get dressed, and I'm going against whoever that guy is. Wow. That's how I was. They wow. always came to my house. There's this guy. I'll be right there. Yeah, yeah. And I'd go and play, and we'd become friends. Wow. We'd become friends. I, I met a guy in... in uh, in the, the, high, the junior high school I went to, I used to go past there sometimes and play basketball. Sure. It's still there, the IS-44. They have a nice yard. And I went there with a, a friend of mine. We were walking by, and I saw these guys playing. I said, I feel like playing. And I went into play. Big tall brother. His name yeah. was Gerald Tapper. I didn't know him at the time. Mm. So we're playing, and I'm like, I like the big guys, because I like yeah. to go against the, the bigger guys. Sure. So I start playing hard with him. And he's like, damn, you know, like, you go hard. I'm like, I love basketball. So we keep going. And then one, my, one of the guys that was with me says, yo, Doc, we got to go to the studio. So he turns around. He goes, wait a minute. You're Doc, like, from BDP? I'm like, yeah. He goes, oh, my God. This guy's one of my greatest friends. I just met him. And that very same weekend, I took him. He's from Philly. I took yeah. him to the, to the uh, Spectrum wow. on stage. And he was so excited. That he, I told him, listen, hold on to my back because I got to go on stage with KRS. Sure. And he swung his arms out of happiness and threw my back into the crowd. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Luckily, there was nothing important. Oh but he'll God. tell you that that's how we were. If you that's were cool, funny. I said, listen, you from Philly, you ever been to the Spectrum? I go watch games. I said, you ever been on stage? Yeah. I'll bring you. And he thought I was lying. I brought him to the stage. Wow. Yeah, his name is Gerald Tapper. We call him Big Tap. Okay. And he sure. was one of my guys in the Hoop It Up. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and we just met on the street. Wow. And he, you know, when he knew, after he was, we were having a great time, but once he knew I was in music, he's like, oh my God, I know who you are. But many people didn't know that Doc was Puerto Rican. Yeah. Because yeah. I wasn't in videos. Sure. And they wouldn't have known me by seeing me because you didn't see me in a lot of things. I'm in a few videos, but not a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, once he heard the guy, he's like, oh my God, you're DJ Doc from BDP? I'm like, yeah. And that's how we became friends. Wow. Yep. And we're still friends today. And wow. he lives in New York. Wow. And then I went to his house. I met his mother, his family, when sure. I was out there, and we became great friends. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. That's Absolutely. Very, I mean, it, for me, the music is, is a job, like a policeman or a sanitation man or a plumber. It's a job. Sure, sure. That's why the hype doesn't work. Absolutely. You know, if you get too caught in the hype, and that thing comes down on you, ooh. Yeah. No, it's a job. Absolutely. It was a job. I love it. Um, I had a lot of fun traveling, but it was no more than that. Sure. No sure. more than that. I, I um. I remember after the P, the Philly thing, this is where, in, in a nutshell, the whole hype thing comes to me. I went to do a show with BDP. We were on the Dope Jam tour. That was the Rakim tour. Okay, Us, sure. um, Kumo D, Dougie Fresh. And it, depending on the town you went to, the local act would jump in. Yeah, yeah. So if we went to LA, Ice-T get in. Okay, sure, sure. So we went to Virginia. Okay. I believe the place was called the Virginia Squire. One of the great things about KRS, he is a thousand percent 
what you hear. Yeah. There's no flashing bulbs, sound effects, um, stories. He had no gadgets, no gimmicks. Sure. Everyone had some nice visuals, which were great. We didn't have that. Yeah. We were just raw. Yeah. So he and I would talk in the in in the, in the in the dressing room. What do you want to do? We'd figure it out right before the show. Yeah. No practice. Wow. Because we already knew each other. Sure, sure. I was his DJ. I was helping him producing and engineering. I was his roadie. Yeah. Whatever he needed, I, I would do. So we went to do that show. And sometimes we'd start criminal minded and I'd backspin it a few times and he'd pause his verse, whatever sounded cool. Sure. So we did the show. The show was good. It wasn't great, yeah. but it was good. Yeah. When we got off the stage, um, one of the guys that was with, uh, what was the name of that group? Heavy D. Oh, okay, okay. One of Heavy D's guys came up and he goes, Doc, that show was ridiculous. <laughs> and right there, it snapped. I said, oh my God. It's hype. Yeah. Right there, it hit me. Yeah. Right there. That's hype, yeah. It changed everything I saw going forward. Wow. And that was just in the middle, beginning, middle of my career. Sure. And I went, oh my God. It's so embedded that they believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see what you put out there, but you actually believe it. Sure, sure. And that's when I knew a big chunk of this is all hype. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the show was not bad in any sense. It didn't suck. It wasn't boring, but it wasn't great. Yeah. I did nothing special. Sure, sure. I did nothing that I went, that was special. No, yeah. I did a solid show. It was tight. And he made it seem like I had two turns. It was floating in the air. Sure. And that point going forward, I always I always used uh, Chuck D as an example. Don't believe the hype. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the majority of it's hype. Sure. Absolutely. Because I always had a, a, way to, a way to determine it. I said, if anyone ever thinks that they're not part of hype, try this. Take four guys, whatever they are, DJs, producers, put them behind a curtain. There's no mic. Yeah. Nobody can hear the tone of your voice. Nobody knows who you are. You do it for 20 minutes. You do it. You do it. You do it. I promise you, all four will say no. <laughs> yeah. Because without the hype, <laughs> yeah, they won't make an they won't make an effect. Yeah, for sure. Then it's necessary to scream and and things exploding, and because without that, the skill has to come into Absolutely. effect. Absolutely. That... So, same thing with production. Production. I, I I once I learned about it and how it was made. I said, not that difficult. Yeah. Creativity is important, sure, sure. but producing, not that difficult. Yeah. And of course, people would take it and hype it to the levels where you thought you were dealing with Stevie Wonder. <laughs> now that is a genius. Yeah, Stevie That's Wonder. That's a genius. Absolutely. A guy looping a song, not so much. Yeah, yeah. That's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, for I've sure. done them pure. I've done them where, where I had looping. I've done all types. For sure. Um. And if somebody told me this record you did did. It didn't do this, but it did this, and it's true. I would say you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not going to tell you. No, you, you're not hearing this. No, because that's hype. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. when that guy, that one guy, told me, "Man, that was fire," I went, hype. "Not really." Yeah. And that's when I went into the dressing room by myself, and I went, "Wow." And I remember also another moment. We were in Germany. We were on the autobahn. Boogie Down Productions. Sure. So it's a long stretch limo, and it's doing 80 because you got to do a minimum. Yeah. Now, the majority of the guys are in, in that corner of the limo and they're, you know, having a good time and yo, yeah, whatever. And I went to the corner, the other corner, there was no one there. And they're like, yeah. you're right now, I'm good. And I remember lowering the window and I could see the moon. And I looked at the moon and I looked at them and I'm like, wow, what am I doing here? Like, yeah. I'm a little punk kid from Hell's Kitchen, New York. <laughs> I have nothing to do with hip hop. Yeah. I didn't grow up in it. I grew up in salsa and R&B. Yeah. I said this is a blessing. Yeah. I yeah, was yeah. thankful, but you couldn't get me overly excited because that's hype. Sure. I, sure. I'm not gonna believe that I can fly out of this window. <laughs> I'm thankful. I'm almost yeah. ashamed to be there. Yeah. In the sense, I'm saying like I work hard, but wow, look at where I, I'm in Germany. Yeah. Most yeah. people don't leave my neighborhood the corner. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you do a wedding, you're happy. For sure. I'm DJing stadiums. I know. Where if I move my hand a certain way, 20,000 people are waving around. <laughs> and I remember I would get goosebumps out of that because sure. I enjoyed it. I'm sure. And I was like, ah, and like, oh my God. Like, where you come, <laughs> if you know where I come from, then you too can feel it. Yeah. But if I had hype involved, I would have said, yeah, I, I deserve more. Of course. No, yeah, yeah, I yeah. don't deserve more. Whatever they gave me, I'm thankful for. Yeah. Because I worked for it, but it wasn't. I, I never got it easy. It was always difficult. It was difficult being Latino. Absolutely. It shouldn't have been, but it was. Sure. It was difficult that I didn't get high. Sure. I didn't partake in a lot of things that maybe a lot of guys did simply because I don't. Yeah. So I wouldn't fit in. Yeah. So yeah, it was yeah. triple the work to prove that I could do what 
was necessary where if I just took part in a few things, I didn't have to work as hard. Yeah, yeah, That doesn't yeah. exist for me. Sure, sure. And it's mostly my ethics. It's just it's just the way I'm built. Absolutely. I have to give 100% or I'll tell you I, I don't want to do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't want, it's simply pretty easy. I, I don't want it easy. Yeah. I don't, you, you know, challenge. I don't want free money. Sure. Yeah, I'll sure. give you an extra this. I don't want an extra this. Yeah. It's just me. It's just, yeah. it's just, it's just me. But when you hire me, you know you're getting a thousand percent. Absolutely. And no hype whatsoever. Yeah. Absol I just, <laughs> no, I don't want nothing to do with hype. quality. I don't have anything set. in my personal equipment that goes wah, wah, wah. <laughs> no, good. I don't. That's good. That's I have good. A, a couple of mics only because in the last few events, I talk about cancer. Sure, sure, So, sure. and even that's difficult for me because I don't like being up front yeah. but I'll say listen everyone especially gentlemen men are afraid to check prostate cancer yeah. I had prostate cancer yeah. and I tell them it's a simple blood test sure. just take a few minutes out it can save your life absolutely. it saved mine absolutely and uh, I'll talk about it and I'll tell them listen two years now two years ago I could have lost my life yeah I remember when I did my first outdoor concert uh, event for Hell's Kitchen the day before I found out I had cancer so while I was at the concert I wasn't there wow. my friends told me it was great I'm like no, it wasn't. Yeah. I said I, wa I wasn't focused. Nobody knew because I didn't say it, but in my mind, I was like, I'm going to die. I'm sure. going to die. It just kept circling. And then the next morning, while everyone was recovering from hanging out or going out, I was in the hospital getting needles stuck in me and all kinds of gadgets and, and just to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Very tough journey. But wow. I share that because I want people to, you know, why should you die if you don't need to? Sure, sure, Simple, sure. Simple, little blood test. Listen sure. to the doctor. Sometimes close your mouth, listen to your ears, you know, and they'll help you. So I talk about that with my mics, but otherwise, no mics, yeah. no mics, no wham wham, none of those effects. Sure. Everything is two hands. The CDs I gave you, you'll see yeah. all of that is live. Yeah. And you'll see how I combine songs. That's all done with my hands and, and with the concept. That's the way I learned in, in the late 70s. And the thrill was I got from one song to another and you didn't realize how I did it. That's it. <laughs> That's, That's how, how you, you know. know you did it right. A really good DJ. But just stopping yeah. it and playing another song, just put the radio on. That's yeah, what they do on the absolutely, radio. Absolutely, absolutely. That's what they do on the radio. Oh, how you doing? But next song. Yeah. Oh, how you doing? Next. Oh no, you don't need me for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I just, I'd rather not. For me, um, no matter how great. Yeah. It wouldn't happen. Sure, sure. It's the truth. Absolutely. And when you're dedicated to what you do, you gotta make it work. Absolutely. You have to because if you don't, you feel like you didn't accomplish your job. Sure. That's sure. why a lot of a lot of engineers. I mean, I'm sure it still happens today, but coming up when I came up. Patrick Adams, Eli Tubo, Naughty Cotto, Yanni Papadopoulos, rest in peace, um, myself, Christopher Irish. There were so many in power play that I'm so proud to be a part of that group. Yeah. And we knew when a person came in, I like his idea, he's so totally lost. And that's not an insult, that's just a reality. Sure, sure, sure. I don't play baseball. I remember trying to umpire a game. I got him the draw once with a fastball with kids. I said, okay. I will never play this game in my life. Sure, sure, Because sure. I don't have the reflexes. Sure, absolutely. absolutely. It is my reality. I play softball, but I'm not touching a hardball. I don't know how baseball players could hit a curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just, yeah. you know, like you need a skill to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So when they would see it, Patrick Adams made, mentioned it recently in, in, a, in a piece of, of, of the documentary to hopefully to be released On by Power Play. Right? Yeah. He explains. If we didn't do what we did, you wouldn't know who they are. Absolutely. Because if you let them, and sometimes we would, sometimes we'd say, well, you know what? There's enough energy and ego. Sure, sure. There you go. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Because I'm not your producer. I'm an engineer. I'm supposed to hit play and record yeah. when you tell me to. Yeah. I'm supposed to punch you in when you tell me to. Yeah. How you play keyboards and all, that's on you, not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We couldn't do that because sure. we knew the note was flat. We, we like like for instance uh, if a person was playing flat and he'd go play something I'm like your keyboard's out of tune you sure you have do you have a tuner I said pick up um, pick up the telephone yeah. it's 440 Hertz listen to the telephone hit the key oh my god you're right I said tune the key to the telephone tone yeah. that's the cheapest way to tune anything sure because it's 440. If they understood you were trying to help them, now you're a team. Yeah, yeah, If they yeah. felt you're trying to embarrass them, now you're not. Yeah. I'm never there against you. If you hire me, I'm going to do absolutely everything to make you sound great. Absolutely. And if you're smart, you'll listen. Absolutely. I had an outstanding relationship with KRS, EPMD, Redman. Sure. Redman is outstanding. He doesn't get the credit he needs. Yeah, um, yeah. Biz. And why? Because they would listen. Yeah. Now, if they go to an average person, that person's starstruck. 
yeah. when they do something, yo, that's so dope. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> no, we need to do that again. Sure, sure. After a few times, then they realize. They realize, yeah, So yeah, when yeah. it's all done and the whole crowd is, oh, where are Doc, where are we? I said, this is good. This needs to be done over. He said, yo, let's do it over. Yeah, 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 sure. Because sure. I'm, not, I'm not, you don't pay me every time I tell you to do it over. Yeah. I'm telling you because my ears tell me no. And that sense I told you that I get when something moves me, yeah. I'm like, ooh. When I first heard KRS, I heard KRS, he was like a kid. Yeah. And I went, ooh, this guy's, he's special. Absolutely. This guy's special, different. He and KRS changed the whole game. Absolutely. And yeah. I was there with him, with Scott, when Scott got murdered. Sure. I went through all of that oh, with them. Man. I was there from the beginning. I remember when they came in, not KRS per se, but the whole B-boy posse. Sure. I had to make a decision. They're either going to step on me or I'm going to control the situation. Yeah. The owner of the studio, t uh, Ant Anthony Arfi, told me, Doc, there's a, a posse of people coming from B-Boy Records. Nobody knows who they are. Yeah. I don't know who they are. Can you take them? I was like, sure, Tony, no problem. Sure. I I wait for them. They come in, all this noise, ah, ah, grabbing a crotch, all that. It wasn't Chris, but there was a, 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 a bunch, ABC sure. Force. There was other groups, sure, not sure. just BDP. Absolutely, yeah. So they all come in the studio. So once they pile in, I walk in, there's coats on top of my console. <laughs> so I said, fellas, all of this shit got to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All this yeah, gotta, yeah, you got to yeah, take yeah. all of this out. Yeah. And I told, I didn't know who Chris was at the time. I said, sure. whoever's first is here. The rest of you, get out. Yeah. I said, I'll call you according to when we, you, we need you. Absolutely. It wasn't disrespectful, but I had to do that because if not, it would have been a circus. Absolutely. From there... The few groups that tried kind of fell off, and BD put stu BDP stood with us. Sure. And my impression was enough that I became a part of the group. Yeah. I never asked, can I, will I? Sure, KRS sure, sure. asked me, can you do this? I said, I can do that. Absolutely. Can you do this? Uh, this person is not here. Can you play that? I said, I can play that. Yeah. Now, my, my growing up in Hell's Kitchen tells me I don't need to ask you to respect me. Sure. I don't need to ask you to give me my proper credit. Sure. Because I'm treating you like my brother. Yeah. So I'm going to give you what you asked. Because you asked for it. Yeah. And I'm sure that when I am supposed to get mines in return, you're going to do your part as well because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. That doesn't work like that. Yeah. Not in hip-hop. Yeah. Um, maybe in other, other uh, genres as well. Sometimes, but not always. Because sure. um, the facts, truth be told, if, if that was a reality, I would have already received an, a Lifetime Achievement Award. I know. I know. And, I, and I'm, that's, again, I'm not about hype. I'm not a front sure. man. But sure. I've done... An amazing amount of work. Absolutely. Like outrageous amount absolutely. of millions and millions of CDs, records, and downloads around the entire globe have sure. my name on them. Sure, absolutely. But it is what it is. There was a point in my career where it really bothered me. Yeah. You grow. Yeah. Um, doesn't bother me as much now. I'm, if anything, I'm disappointed. Sure. But if I can speak and help maybe somebody else learn this or that. But I went in there and I treated all of them as if it was my friend from Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, yeah, Or my yeah. cousin or my brother that I trust totally. And uh, we had great times. But some of it wasn't, you know, you didn't get what you thought you would get. And I'm not talking about money. Sure, sure. Money comes and goes. Recognition, Recognition, right? respect. Respect, yeah. Because I respect Bruce Sweden. He died. Sure. I never met him. But I respect him immensely. I respect Patrick Adams. Yeah. Wow, what a genius. Um, I respect Naughty Cotto. I respect all these fellas that came up Eli Tubo. Um, there's competition sure. from other studios. Whether they see it or not or knew it, I respect them. Absolutely. I had engineers, and forgive me for, for because there's so much that comes to me. Sure, sure. I had engineers that would go out of their way to try to ruin a two-inch tape knowing that it was coming to me. Wow. And I never, back then nor now, because yeah. if they knew me, they would have said, I wouldn't give Doc a hard time. Yeah. We're on the same team. Sure, we're sure. Both, you're going to have credit for one recording, I'm gonna, but we're together. Yeah, absolutely. When I started EPMD, they were working with Charlie Murata. I always had a great relationship, even from a distance, because he didn't sure. do anything to hinder my work, and I'm taking his work to another level. Yeah, yeah. I never said, listen, it's me. Erase his name. No, no he was no. there. I would have engineers. When we, when we would do what we did, we would synchronize tape machines. Oh, okay, so okay. we would have to lay either... An, a FISC tone, FSK, frequency shift keying, which is how the telephones work. Okay, okay. And that would synchronize a device, but it will only synchronize it on the one. Uh, you couldn't pause in the middle of a tape and go. It sure, lost. Sure. You can only do that with SIMPTY mm -hmm. when you do audio for video or whatever. So whether they would use SIMPTY or FISC, 
they would take the signal, put it through a digital delay, and delay it by a certain amount of seconds, then print it to the tape. Wow. Then they would synchronize using that method, and when it came to me, the machine would synchronize late. Wow. It took me literally five seconds. My assistant <laughs> goes, something's wrong, and I laughed, and he goes, what are you laughing at? I'm like, it's on purpose. Yeah. He goes, what do you mean? I said, whatever that SMPTE is, put it through a delay. Yeah. Bring it to 0.5. Boom, locks perfectly. He goes, why would they do that? <laughs> Or they wow. would drop a, a low-end signal yeah. to tape and kill the low end. Wow. Why? I know. I would never send tapes. To, my tapes are coming to you in excellent condition sure. because it's me. Sure. Why would I send you something, make you work twice as hard just to figure out how to make it yeah. play? Yeah. I went through that. Wow. These are things that are not in newspapers yeah. or in TV or sure. you hear a record. You don't know how hard it was sure, sure, to sure. get past this simply because... You had some kind of opinion about my work or me or something, and I never had a disagreement with anyone in the hip hop community ever. Yeah, yeah, ever. Yeah, yeah. I was there to help. I remember when my my daughter was little, my daughter Crystal. I'm very dedicated, so weekends were always Crystal's. Sure. And EPMD was on the road. Russell Simmons called me because I was signed to I was signed to Rush Productions Management, oh, RPM. Oh yes, yes, yes. Russell called me personally. Doc, EPMD's on the road. You got to chill, which I didn't do, the, the original mix. He said the echo is too loud, which it was. Sure. That's how you knew that the person was new, the engineer, because he would feed the delay, but the return was so loud, it would mm. peak. So it blows out speakers. Sure. Causes distortion. So Russell goes to me, we really need a remix, and we need it badly, and I know you're with Crystal. Bring her. Uh -huh. I said, Russell, he goes, I know what it means to you, Doc, but this is an emergency. Yeah. He sent the car for me. Okay. Me and Crystal went to the studio. Um, I redid the whole thing. The car brought me back. That's how I am. I didn't go, wow. no, it's Crystal and that's it. Sure, sure, I sure. I said, okay, I'll bring Crystal with me. Yeah. I have pictures of Crystal in the studio since she was <laughs> a little kid. That's funny, wow. She knew LL and all of them before she knew. They sure. were just people. Yeah, of course. Because yeah, she was yeah, a little yeah. guy. And yeah. she always came with me. All of them know about Crystal because I always brought her. Because I was dedicated to my, my time with her. But he called me for that and I would do it. When I signed to RPM, he had Leo Cohen bring me in. And me and Leo had a talk. And Leo sure. said to me, quote, unquote, I know you're the secret behind a lot of this. And yeah. I said, what secret? He goes, I know. Yeah. It gets to me. You know, I know what you do and what you don't get credit for. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot I did because I had to, because the record had to come out right. Sure, sure. You know, you could be hitting a drum machine for 20 minutes, and I'm like, can I, can I ask you, is this what you're trying to do? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Very, very mm -hmm. famous statement in the studio. I like that. I yeah, like that's that. it. Yeah. But that doesn't translate into co-production, additional I production. Know. Um any monetary no it doesn't it just it, it just translates into thank you yeah yeah and even if you don't want to pay me but you give me the credit that means i'm going to get work somewhere else absolutely not absolutely. if you don't tell people it was me i know i know it is what it is wow eventually people knew because you can hear my sound no matter what group i work sure, on you sure, go sure. that's doc that's very, i can hear it very distinct and when he's gone that's not doc yeah yeah that it doesn't have it just doesn't feel like it yeah so yeah i went through that period and i'm like I can't change that. I can't change people. I'm not going to waste my time suing people. This is not who I am. Sure, sure. I'll continue to do what I do, and, and I'll enjoy it as best I can. Maybe one day that somebody will, will uh, get past that ego and say, you know what? That was him. Yeah. And that, that wasn't me. That was him. Yeah. If you listen to early BDP, especially uh, By All Means Necessary, when Chris Rhines, he talks to a guy yeah. with a little funny voice. Yeah. That's me. That's you. That's yeah, my yeah, voice. Yeah. I did that. Yeah. Because he didn't have... I said, Chris, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have um, to go back and listen yeah, to Yeah, just that. listen yeah. to it. Yeah, um, I will. When he talks, and also in I'm Still Number One Remix, there's a guy. Yeah. Sounds like a funny guy. That's me. That's you. Okay, sure, sure, I sure. I just went in and did it for him. Um, he, um, when he did By All Means Necessary, a lot of the stuff you hear is me live cutting it. Ah. I'm cutting the, the looping, not sure. looping it. Sure, sure, um, sure. My philosophy, all the stuff you hear in the beginning, yes, you could, yes, yeah. Cause you're a philosopher. That's all me. That's amazing. That's all me. I, I love that song. And then yeah. all you hear those horns, doo -doo 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 -doo, that's a record that I'm cutting in, not a loop. Sure, sure. All of that, and then and for, for um, stop the violence from yeah. that same album. Yeah. If you listen to it carefully again, because you don't really know in the beginning, he says, um, BDP is the freshest. Yeah. And then yeah, you hear yeah, something yeah. going whoop, 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 back. Sure, sure. Well, if you listen carefully, when the beat drops in, the song's going forward and backward. Wow. I did that by flipping the two-inch tape upside down and cutting into 
a reverse two inch tape. Wow. And then I, I went into it and then I faded my way out. And then when you flip it back around, it goes whoop, 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 and you hear it going shoot, 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 shoot. That's not a gimmick, that's me. Sure. But I had to flip the tape. That's amazing. If a, if a loop was too long for a, a sampler, you could put the loop on a piece of half inch tape, edit it together with tape, and with a pencil, pull it away from the machine because it was too long, and it would loop. Wow. You would run that onto two tracks, and then you would have to synchronize live to sure. that loop. Oh my God, wow. If you listen to, um, Dopey. I got a dopey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got a dopey. Well, there's a tom tom in there that goes doom ka doom ba. Sure. Doom ka doom. I'm playing those toms live oh, no on a way. Yamaha RX11. <laughs> I, I, I love that song too. Yeah, and I played and, those on yeah. an RX11. Yeah. Because we, I used whatever was in the studio. We didn't have sure. money like that. Sure. And in the very beginning, we didn't have sampling like that. Sure. We had, I think, an emulator that sampled for like a second, which sucked. Wow. So um, I would come up with whatever I needed to come up with. So there was a lot of things I did on PDP by all means necessary that would have were it to have been maybe rock, it would have been more recognized. Uh, the, the, sure. the concept would have been like, wow. Yeah. But not only were it being early hip hop, but not getting, getting the credit I required, yeah, yeah, they didn't yeah. even know. Yeah. But absolutely. now you listen and you go, wow, now I can envision him flipping the tape. Absolutely. But it was yeah, the two inch yeah, tape yeah. flipped upside down and then I cut into it. And um, I did a lot of work on, on uh, self-destruction. Okay, and sure, self-destruction, sure. you don't—you weren't only dealing with a project; you were dealing with multiple egos. Yeah. You know, yeah, some people yeah. didn't want anyone in the room when they rhymed. Yeah. Um. Some people wouldn't come into the studio if another person was there. It was just like, oh my God, would you making a record? Yeah. 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 It was a lot of challenges. Wow. There was a lot of challenges. Um, it wasn't as simple as Ben. That's the hottest record out. I know. You yeah. don't know what it went to put that record together. Yeah. Not not only all of the you know technological innovations that you had to come up with on the fly on the fly the the music you know the the playing of of probably you know just a handful of instruments that you had to make right. come together and dealing with personalities all of all, that all of that especially all the personalities and um and when we, we needed a new snare i would just take a piece of wood or a box mic it hit it and that would be the snare on top of whatever uh, snare i was using and i would layer it another thing on the fly i believe i mentioned to you over the phone Scott LaRock had been murdered. Our first concert is Madison Square Garden. Yeah. I normally spin for Chris, but because Chris wanted wanted to show respect to, to Scott, sure. we all agreed that instead of me spinning, we would place a big picture of Scott on the turntables and I would do the show to a reel to reel. Wow. So we did the show live in power play. I did it to tape. Yeah. Made sure the levels were perfect because I knew we were going to the garden. Sure, sure, sure. One of his I think it's a roadie or a bodyguard. One of them was carrying the reel. When we went into Madison Square Garden, he dropped it. No. I didn't no. know until like five minutes to showtime. Ladies and gentlemen, coming on stage, BDP. And Chris comes to me, he goes, Doc, they dropped the reel to reel. I could have easily turned around and said, I didn't drop it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I said, show me the reel. Where is it? No panic, just show it to me. And we went, I flipped it over. One side was completely smashed. I'm like... The take up reel is no good. And I'm thinking, what can we do to make it pull? Yeah. And I said, wait a minute, there's two cap stands, there's a pinch roller. Let me try something. So I um I held the pinch roller, the, the that little thing that goes up with the tape. Yeah. I held yeah, it with yeah. my finger and I noticed that the reel moved. <laughs> I'm like, I got it. Go on stage. Wow. I, I said, just go. I said, follow everything the way we did it, disregard this. So when they went on stage, I had the reel come through. I had the tape here and I held the cap stand here and as soon as he nodded, I hit play and everything ran to the floor, but it ran. Wow. So that first show. Unreal. Exactly. Unreal. So it happened because I figured it out on the spot. <laughs> but if not, there would have been no show because I didn't bring records. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah, we were going to sure. do this and this is because somebody dropped the reel. I would have preferred to let me take it. Absolutely. But I didn't have control of the reel. But Absolutely. we got past the show and then he thanked me and I said, Hopefully that doesn't happen again. Yeah. yeah. Because that could have really sucked. Cause we first time in Madison Square Garden and we can't even perform. I know. Wow. So that that was a real challenge. Wow. That was a, like you see again. You see that in a rock concert or something. It's like oh my god. To me it was like how do we do? What do we do? How do we fix this? Absolutely. We fixed it. We moved on. We got rid of the real to real. I think from that whenever we needed a show that needed tape, we would do it off that. Okay. Okay. A portable sure, that. Sure. Sure, but and then I always brought records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always yeah. brought records, yeah. just in just case. Just in case. Yeah, but we learned from that. Wow. We got past it. 
that was one of those moments where it's like, oh my God. And you know, deep down inside, you say, man, I hope they can really appreciate. Sure. That you, if I'm here, no other group has me. It's yeah, just you. Absolutely. And at the end of the game, it just doesn't feel that way. Sure, sure, sure. It doesn't yeah. feel like like that work ethic meant anything. Yeah. I mean, I think it means more to the fans because they love the sound. Sure, so sure. So the fans that buy his records or anybody's records are like, wow, I really enjoyed this. Did you hear what he did here? Listen to this. And and one of my greatest... Now, this is one of my greatest... Um, re- receiving my one of my greatest compliments. Whenever I did records, especially for Jive, Jive hired Chris Geringer as a mastering mm. engineer. I never met him, but he did great work. So might have been Bunny Whaler. I did a money, an album for Bunny Whaler and Bunny said, not only do I want you to do this, I want you to go to mastering. I said, I'm not the engineer. He goes, no, I just want you there. Sure. I said, okay. So I go to the to, to the mastering lab. Chris happens to be the engineer, but I don't know. Him. Okay. He's okay. a gentleman there. Sure. I come in, I say, how you doing? Forgive me, I don't mean to interrupt. I was just asked by the artist if I could sit here, I'll be quiet. Yeah. I give the respect I want to return. So I give him a package, I go sit down and he goes, well, thank you. He goes, don't worry about it. He goes, you know, it's not that difficult or whatever. He opens the bag up, and when he pulls it out, he chuckles. And he goes, oh, this is nothing. It's a piece of cake. I said, what do you mean? He goes, this is Doc Rodriguez. <laughs> that was huge for me because he didn't know me. He didn't know you, So yeah. that's what I'm talking about. Absolutely. So he goes, I do this guy constantly. He goes, his levels are incredible. He yeah. goes, I barely do anything. Wow. And I said, that's me. <laughs> and he said, wow, it's a pleasure to meet you. I said, you don't understand. You, you, you did something really big for me because you don't know me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only yeah, two yeah. people have done that. Him and Bobito Garcia. Bobito oh, Garcia is very famous in his DJ sure, sure. sneakers. He wrote an article in a magazine he and I never met. Yeah. And it was called Latinos in Hip Hop. Okay. And yeah. he said, if you're going to show any respect for Latinos in Hip Hop, you must acknowledge Ivan Doc Absolutely. Rodriguez. And I met him in Florida at the How Can I Be Down conference. We were both speakers. And I said, dude, I appreciate what you did. He goes... I did what was right. It yeah. wasn't personal. I don't know you. Sure, sure, it's, sure. It's a reality. It's the history. It's the history of what you've done. And I said, absolutely. I appreciate that more than a Grammy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Him and Chris are the only two that ever did something like that wow. that came strictly from my work. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's interesting just to, to, to think, you know, just from a, like an archival perspective. Because I, I come across histories all the time working with you know, all different kinds of archival, whether it's documents or photographs or recordings, whatever it might be. And it's, sometimes it's only 20, 30, 40 years after the fact that that people start to piece together all of these. But you've left literal evidence of all of your, so much evidence. I mean, you know, it's there and it's, it's going to be pieced together completely at some point, uh, even if it had, you know, hasn't been as far as, as, um, the, recognition of things like that go because you know you can't destroy that evidence no that's true that's true it's there it's it's uh you know and like i said i enjoy a lot what i do there are those points where where you're like wow i I really worked hard on this and um it just doesn't seem like it makes a difference uh but then you move on yeah 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 and and you know it's it's so interesting to hear about all the different um sampling techniques uh, that you've developed over the years and of course one that um, that I think is also something that you deserve a lot of credit for uh, I don't remember which article it was that I was reading about this um, and but of course you know re- you, you were talking about how remix sits had been around for a long time but really you're the one responsible for like the first like mass sensation remix on the radio right? oh yeah yeah KRS I believe yeah 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 KRS and uh, Philadelphia. Steady beat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and and those things used to happen in the simplest manners. Chris would call me. Yeah. I would. I was still here in eighty second. Sure, sure. I sure. still hadn't had my own crib yet. Yeah, I was yeah, still, yeah. you know, staying, spending time with mom, and spending time at my dad's. And and I had a little room in eighty first, which initially had two turntables, and I had an SP twelve hundred and just a little few pieces. Sure. And Chris would call me. Hey, what's going on? Yo, Doc, this happened, and we need to do this. Yeah. Now yeah, here's yeah. the difference: is today and then. If Chris called me today, we finish the song tomorrow. Sure. By Wednesday, the song's on the radio. Wow. It didn't take months, none of that. Wow. So he said, Doc, we're going to do this thing, and um, it's for Steady B. I think Ann Carly was at Jive at the time, and Ann Carly asked him, can you guys do it? He said, oh, okay, yeah. I said, okay. okay. I wasn't involved in the conversation, but I was 
you know, at the end of it, Doc, can we do this? I'm like, sure. Sure. So he called me. Um, he said, this is the song, whatever, because he had done the song already. Yeah. I'm yeah. serious, I believe it's called. Yeah, yeah, I'm serious. So okay, I listened yeah. to it, and I normally let my 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 mind kind of work around the song. What do I feel? What works? Sure. What about the song Don't I Like? Yeah. And initially, I felt like a, a steady guitar riff, and I started thinking about Dr. John. Oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. Right place, wrong time. Sure. So if you listen to it, when he's going, this is a remix. It's going da na da na da na da na da na da na da na. That's that. That's Doctor John. Yeah, 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 yeah. And at the time, we could use samples because there was no big deal. It was way before Bismarcky sure, and um, sure. the 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 uh, the thing he had with with uh, what was the name of that? Song? Alone again, naturally. Alone Gilbert again, O'Sullivan. Yeah, so that became yeah. a big problem, but that's a whole other story. But I did that, and then I said, you know what? I wanna. I want to use other elements. So I started putting together elements. Sure. So I would show up to the studio with a floppy disk. Yeah. Or two, if it was too many samples. And then he came in, Steady came in, his DJ came in. I loaded it. I took the original tape. I synchronized the first 12 inch, to, uh, the first two inch tape to a second two inch tape. And all I used from the first was the vocals. Wow. I muted all the channels. And yeah. then the second two inch tape, I threw the tracks on. Okay, sure, sure. And then we remixed it like that. And then Chris went in. This is a remix. Yo, Doc, break it down like this. Yeah, yeah. Now, I started to notice when there were songs where Chris would openly, because I've never in my entire career told someone, can you say my name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never. Yeah, yeah. That's all hype. I can't do that. Yeah. I don't. If I deserve it, you'll do it. Yeah. It took a little while, but once you start listening to By All Means Necessary, oh, sure, sure. my name's in it, it quite is, a bit. It is. Different songs, different ways, and when he did, I'm still number one, and my name was the first lyric. I was, I was, I was like, wow, yeah, that's pretty big. That is, that is, because I didn't ask for it. Sure. And um, and then of course the remix. So he would find ways. Then we did another song where he goes, DJ Doc's in the back on the 48 tracks. Yo, Doc, break it down like this. So these are things that he wrote on his own. Yeah, yeah. Then Bismarck, he did it. He put on in one of his songs. He what was it? He said. He said something. With word docking and of course nice and smooth sure, on let's make it funky sure, sure, sure. the breakdown where it goes DJ Doc makes it funky and then they talk about everyone else so it started becoming a trend where at least in that form they would show appreciation yeah 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 even, even but in all of that I've never ever 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 I've never asked I think on one occasion when we did by all means necessary I did so much to that song and I told Chris can you ask Jive if they'll permit my hands in the video, my hands. Sure, sure, because sure. Because the beginning of the song says, so you're a philosopher? Yeah. I said, so I'm cutting it. Just show my hands. And the fact that my hands are light yeah, will yeah. create a process where people, whoa, who's that? Who's that? You don't yeah. have to show my face. For sure, for sure. They refused. Oh, man. They refused, yep. And then the only person that succeeded in, in doing something like that was Spider because Spider fought with Profile Records to let me be on a cover. So the label will always oh, okay, say sure. he's not signed to us directly. We can't do it. So he kept fighting and fighting. And if you look at the 12-inch Spider-D, How You Like Me Now, yeah. even though it's faded, I'm in the background. Oh, okay, okay, sure. They did him in black and white, and they did me in like a like a, like a a muddied color. Mm, but you can see me. You can see you. Okay. And then it says featuring DJ Doc. K uh, Spider was the one artist that always fought for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always gave me the respect that I, I deserved and the and the credit. Always, always, always. And he brought you he brought you into it. He brought if without Spider I wouldn't exist. Together, right? yeah. I wouldn't exist. Yeah. If it wasn't for Spider I wouldn't be involved. I would probably be doing weddings and, and sweet sixteens and that's it. And he he's the one who brought you to power play for the first time too, right? Well, my friend Speedy brought oh, me to Speedy. meet him. Oh, yeah Speedy was okay, the one from okay. my neighborhood that, sure, that was sure, a sure. big you know, he was big into rhyming and he wanted badly to be a rapper and yeah. all this and he kept nudging and nudging and Please, please. And I, one day I said, okay, I'm going to go with you to the studio. And after this, don't bother me no more. Okay, okay. And when he took me, that's when I first met Spider. Ah, okay. And Spider okay, was pretty yeah, popular sure, at the sure. time. He, sure. he had place in the beat was out. And he was producing Sparky D and a few other artists. Yeah. And he was pretty popular. He was he was working for, for uh, the Aleems. They okay. had Nia Records. So he would work for them. He would do projects for them. And um, that's where, where I... He had the, the engineer, which happened to be the owner of the studio, trying to program something, and he just couldn't get it. I'd never touch a drum machine, but I was a wannabe drummer from childhood. Sure, sure, So when sure. he went to take a break, I asked Spider, can I try that? I don't know what it is. What are you hitting? Yeah. He said, that's the kick. That's the snare. When you put these two together, you're going to hear a click. That's the tempo. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. And then I, I did the... I, want, I told him, sing it to me. Yeah. You know, like, hum it. 
and sure. he did the beat and I did it in one take and he went that's it that's it right there yeah and um and I got a thrill out of it because I was a drummer for a few seconds absolutely absolutely and I'm like wow and I, I immediately made up my mind one way or another I gotta buy this I can't afford yeah. it but yeah. I, I gotta get gotta this which way. I did yeah sure. eventually and that's how I met Spider and then um I guess he picked up instantly he's got something yeah yeah and um I think it was a week later Spider called me he said would you go on the road with me that's why it was so shocking I just met this guy <laughs> and I told my mother I'm about to go on the road like like on an airplane yeah and I from that point I kept working with Spider whenever he needed me, and then when other opportunities came, he supported me. He never said, like some people do, oh, you're with me, you can't do this, you can't. He always said, do what you got to do, and make sure you do it well. Sure. And then anything he needs, I still till today, he calls me, I'm there. Yeah. A yeah. track, uh, re whatever you need, you tell me, I'll do it. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's the respect I give. Absolutely. But if it wasn't for Spider, initially, Spark, I mean, Speedy introducing Speedy. me to him, but if Spider did not say to me, can we go on the road? I would not be, no one would know who I am. Sure. Because I wouldn't care. And, and you know, in all honesty, there probably wouldn't be some of the no. best hip hop albums no. of the 80s and 90s exactly. that, yeah, that's that the came truth. out. A lot of that would not have happened because I, I wouldn't have had the influence I had in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I first did the first EPMD project, when they came in, I set up two gobos which are for silence and they were facing each other. I said, why are you facing each other? These things are in front of you. He goes, well, when we record in Long Island, the microphone hangs from a steam pipe, and we're basically spitting each other's face. I said, well, okay, you know, and then you did well with that. I said, but we go to a different level here. And then I had to get them not only to separate, but to kind of be able to flow without seeing each other. Okay. And they did it well. It took a little time, but they did it very well, and I did five albums for them. Wow, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, You know, and I did K-Solo, Red Man, um, so many other projects through them, but... To me, the EPMDs, the greatest duo, true duo of all time. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, but it's a different level. Yeah, different level. You know, yeah. Commercially, Run DMC are kings because of Aerosmith and all, but, but sure. when it comes to street, gritty rhyming, EPMD. EPMD yeah, as a group. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's not to take anything away from any other group. Sure, but sure, they sure. are just. They work so well together. Oh my God. So what you're saying has got to be one of the best hip hop singles in the world. Yeah. Ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 30 plus years later, play it and listen to the speakers. They still rumble. I know. Because I did a lot of stuff to that song to make sure it hit really hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very proud of that song. Yeah. I saw them at, the, at Central Park a few years ago, and when it hit, I was like, wow, it still hits yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. many years later, compared to what's out. Yeah, oh, I know. And, and it was the work I did to make sure that it sounded a certain way and, and, and to make sure that I fixed certain things that they thought might work that I said... And sometimes I would have to fix it without saying anything. Sure. Because sure, you, sure. The, the, the egos with certain people are very fragile. Yeah. So I said, I can fix it. I don't have to tell them because it's gonna, it's gonna, and as long as they feel it, Absolutely. the job is done. Absolutely. Because, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I changed that. No, I didn't want that change. You didn't even know I changed. Yeah, I know. It's the ego. Absolutely. So some things you leave alone, you just do it and leave it alone. Sure, sure, sure. And it worked. And I actually, I was going to ask you if there were particular songs that stood out to you. That's clearly one of them. Oh, yeah. That you've worked on over the years. What, oh. what are some other songs that you've worked on? EPMD? Oh. Either MPM, EPMD or other MC Light. I did. I, I did. I finally got production credit on Poor Georgie. I got production, sure. assistant production on um, Cappuccino. I did the remix for Cappuccino. Yeah. I did a remix for Cram to Understand You, and I did that on a four-track cassette deck, <laughs> a Tascam four-track cassette. That's insane. And then I mixed it through an SSL console, but it was coming off a cassette. Wow. And if you listen to it, because of the way I set it up and I EQ'd it. And I would split the tracks on the console to give them like three frequencies. Sure. It sounds like it came from a two-inch tape. That's unbelievable. Um, I did a wow. bunch of artists for Flavor Unit for Latifah. Sure. I, I worked on the on the first Fuji's album. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, I worked on the first Fuji's album. Um, I worked with Naughty by Nature when they were called the New Style before they were Naughty by Nature. Ah. They were called the New Style. It's a pink album. If you ever see it, ah. I did that. Okay. Um, the DJ had a high top fade, and it was the same three guys: Tretch and the other guy. Um, Wow, it's so many. I did records for for uh, Tough City. Sure, sure. I did I did Spoonie G, The Godfather. I yeah. I worked on that. I worked with a lot of the. I, I lucked up because I worked a li I worked a little bit with with like like the rappers that used to go who yeah. you know and all yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah. Throw yeah. your hands. All of, I started right around there into KRS and and, and Rakim. Sure, sure. Because sure, I worked sure. on on Paid in Full and. Um, by all means necessary. I worked on Criminal Minded. Yeah, sure. Criminal Minded, they didn't put my credit on it. 
And it, I don't think it had to do with Chris. I had to. I think it had to do with the record label. The record label, yeah. But I did all of Criminal Minded. I mean, not from scratch. They, there was some stuff recorded. Sure. But sure. Once I took Criminal Minded under my wing, I redid a lot of the kicks and snares. There were some parts that were out of time. I kept apart, but I pulled them back with a delay to try to get them in time because I'm a big fanatic of timing. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So I, I fixed a lot of that. Um, I helped Scott a lot. Scott was a really good guy, too. And um, it was only natural that for, by all means necessary, I kind of took care of all those duties, and it was pretty much me and Chris. Sure, sure. Um, gosh, there's so many. Bunny Whaler. I did a full album for Bunny Whaler. Um... I worked with the main ingredient, the R&B group, okay. main ingredient. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did stuff for Tommy Boy. I did stuff for, there was a group called the Mysterious Misfits for Sony. I don't know whatever happened to them, but I did a huh. full album for them. I did the Youngsters, which ended up being y, um, um, Young Z and um, Rod Digger, which wow. when she went with, with um, when she went with, what's his name? Oh gosh, Buster. Oh, when sure, she went sure, with Buster, sure. she Buster, blew. Yeah. I did their first album. That's they crazy. were kids. That's crazy. They were young kids. There was a really rugged group from Brooklyn called the Bushwhackers. Oh. Or sometimes they used to call themselves Bushwhack Ass. Okay, Bushwhack. Whatever they said. Yeah, it. Yeah, sure, I did sure. a full album for them, wow. and um, I don't know what happened, but I did that album as yeah. well. I, 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 you know, I got the CD and, and uh, I have a lot of track sheets and stuff from all the sessions. Um, Gosh, it's just biz. I did just a friend. Sure, sure. I did that 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 record that that unfortunately he got sued on, and it was a concern. We discussed it because it was a really long sample, and I kept mentioning to him, "This is a bit on the long side." Yeah, yeah. But he said Burt Padell, which was the accountant. Burt Padell was huge. He was the accountant for like Mike Tyson, Michael Jackson. Nobody's bigger than Burt Padell, I think, on the planet. Sure. Um, he said Burt Padell's taking care of it. So I said, "Okay." Okay. I mean, who's gonna question Burt Padell? Yeah. Powerful man. And he ends up getting sued, Man. big. The original CD got yanked from the shelves. They had to remove the song from it. Gilbert O'Sullivan said he didn't get permission. Um, I personally didn't see what the big deal was because I, I think they were willing to pay him, but yeah, it might have been personal, who knows? Yeah, yeah, but he yeah. didn't like it. He clearly didn't like it. So he made a big deal out of it. And after that, sampling changed. Yeah. After that, that loss. Changed, yeah. Um, Obviously, KRS, I did Criminal Minded, By All Means Necessary, sure. and I did portions of the third album, Oh, um, um, Ghetto Music. Yeah, yeah Ghetto yeah, yeah, Music. Ghetto I did music. portions of Ghetto Music. Of course, all the remixes. I did the five EPMD albums. I did two Redman albums. I did Redman and Method Man. It's just so many. I know. It's yeah, so many. absolutely. Um, absolutely. I did a lot of singles. I did... Singles that you may not remember or even know, but there was a girl from Philly called Yvette Money. I did her first single. Uh, um, there was some girls from from um, Select Records. I did mm. their singles. I mean, there was a point where I couldn't do but one room at a time, but three artists hired me at the same time, sure. and I would run from one studio to the other to the other. And I said, I'm not going to be able to give you 100%. He says, I don't care as long as you're there. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I would tell the assistant, do this and do not do this. Sure. And sure. I would go room to room to room. Wow. And all three records would be top billboard the same year. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just because I love what I do. Yeah. I said, yeah, I, I could do it. If I can't do it, I'll say no. Sure, sure. And uh, I remember doing those. Um, I even did a, an early demo with Alicia Keys. Okay. Out of my personal studio, okay. my wow. private studio, because she came in with a gentleman that was a rapper. His name was El Muhammad. Mm. He was part of a management that was managing her. Oh, okay. okay. So he I brought see. her to my studio, I see. and I believe I might still have a some sort of disc that has her vocals, whatever it was she did. She did like some choruses and some other things for him. Sure. But I remember that. Wow. Um, there was also that great sensation of doing something and then a week later hearing it on the radio. Yeah. Like I remember when we did Just a Friend and it knocked like Billy Joel off the charts and I was in <laughs> utter shock. Yeah, for like, sure. Dude, you knocked Billy Joel off the charts. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. Big. That is huge. That is really big. And you know, I still hear these songs. I'll see kids bopping their heads, and I'm like, they had. They would not believe if I told them, yeah, that's my record. They'd yeah, be like, yeah, no, yeah. it's not. And it, and if you told them, you know, everything that went into it. Yes. Yeah, no. Because yeah, pe people people don't really have much of a sense. I mean, you know, e even people who work in re recording studios now don't have much of a sense of what no. it took back then. No, I, mean, I remember going to a studio not too long back in, I think it was Electric Lady, which is okay. big because yeah, sure. Hendrix. Sure. And the assistant they gave me, and I, I've always prided myself in treating them with respect because assistants don't get treated right. Sure, Everybody sure, has sure. to be an assistant. 
and I told the young kid, well, I have two projects. One of them is uh, Pro Tools, the other one's Two Inch Tape. And he was very honest. He said, I could do the Pro Tools to help you, but I don't know what Two Inch Tape is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, that machine right there, this tape, he goes, okay, how do you reel it? Yeah. And I said, well, you see, there's a drawing. Sure. He said, I told him, follow the drawing with the tape, and then reel it here, and then it'll lock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was shocking to me that he told me they didn't teach us that in school. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They don't teach any analog background. Yeah, yeah. Because it's really more about the money. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, Pro Tools, you click this, you click this, and... To me, analog is more important because it's the basis. Absolutely. You, you go back, and I'm like, if you understand how this works, this is going to come out better, and you're going to create sure. better. Sure, But he didn't know, sure. which was unfortunate for him because he paid a lot of money to go to school. Oh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. He didn't have any clue. I mean, if you told one of my guys, if they don't know how to reel up a tape, they would they would just fall on the floor laughing. Yeah, 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 Because it's basic. Sure. It's like putting a cassette in. For sure. But not for the kid. No, I know. He told me, no, I don't know how to do that, and I showed him, and, and it was fine, but... It just told me the direction things were going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And manufacturers, they they need to sell stuff. So they're going to do whatever's hot. Absolutely. There's yeah. no real, you know, nobody gets together and says, listen, we need all to make money, but let's try to keep the culture right. Yeah. Let's try to keep the technology that all these hundreds of years or whatever and teach it going forward. No, whatever's the quickest way, make a buck, put some effects in it. Yeah. I mean, you look at a, at a, at a, a DJ controller now, it looks like, it looks like some laboratory. Oh, I know. It's I just know. outrageous. I know. And it's all gimmicks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all gimmicks. How many of those things do you actually need? Exactly, there? exactly. Like, right. I have friends that buy Pro Tools or buy Serato, and I'm like, you do realize this thing can do just about all of this. How many do you use? How much yeah. of it do you use? You go, well, this. Yeah. I said, so you just paid all of this money. For nothing, yeah. You're not going to use any of <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. It's, too, it's too complicated. Yeah, for but sure. But that's what they do, and, and you know, that w it wasn't like that before. Before, you had to go through the paces. You know, for me, I was lucky. I had Patrick Adams, so things that I couldn't really understand, he was kind enough to teach me. He would, show you, yeah. he would come in the studio and always, always kind and, and just a really good guy. Yeah. And super, super talented. Yeah. yeah Hip hop yeah. was nothing to this guy. He was an R and B disco guy. Okay, sure. He sure. wrote songs in the seventies that he probably still gets paid for today. Wow, wow. I mean I saw a news article where they called him the king of disco at yeah, the time. Yeah. He had a group called Music. He played with Black Ivory, and Black Ivory was one of those classic soul groups. Sure. They sang beautiful songs like the stylistic did. He would write, perform them. When MIDI, which is musical digital, musical instrument digital interface, is a plug sure. that permitted equipment to talk. When that came into power play, he's the only one that understood it. Oh, wow. And then Yamaha at the time had a keyboard called a DX7. They created one of the world's first rack mounts that had seven of them or eight of them. I didn't want to look at that thing. Yeah, 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 he yeah. had that thing like one day, the next day you walk in, all these lights are blinking, <laughs> and there's eight different instruments playing. I'm like, wow. damn, Pat. That's crazy. You know, it's not that difficult. That's I think crazy. for you. <laughs> Eventually, I learned it, but he was... And then the Publisan Inferno machine, which is a sampler which changed everything. There may be three people, four. Patrick, myself, Naughty, and Eli. No one else knew how to run it. It was wow. just too complicated. Wow. Patrick initially learned it, and he used it on on uh, paid in full for Rakim. Okay, okay, sure, sure. And uh, and then I got involved in that in in recording a lot of, of of that album. And then from there I learned it, and then I learned to use it and use it in my way, tricks and things of that nature. But it was an incredible machine, and it was like twenty thousand dollars. It was very expensive. <laughs> And it was called the Publisan Infernal Machine. Okay. And sure. it was the first device that could sample 20 seconds. If you bought the more memory, 40 seconds. Yeah. Three minutes. Uh, we really only needed 10, 15 seconds sure. to do the things we did. Sure. And it would permit you to time stretch so you could slow something down without affecting the key. So it wouldn't go flat because that was another mistake a lot of rappers did. Sure, sure. They'd loop stuff and then slow it down. I'm like, it's way out of key. Yeah. And they wouldn't understand. Yeah. Oh, but you know, I'm keeping it real. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you're keeping it flat. Yeah, keeping it flat. It's flat. <laughs> you know, there's other ways. So, you know, there was a lot of that. But Patrick, I remember when I first met him, I was just giving him so much credit for what he did in R&B and disco. I didn't care about him. I'm like, sure. I kept telling you, you're Patrick Adams. Like, Black Ivory. He goes, yeah. I'm like, oh, my God. I said, that is just so amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The strings and things that rappers don't even know what... What's a string at the time? Sure, sure, sure. You know, in, in time, they started using them. And uh, it was Patrick. Yeah. Man, Patrick was just incredible. We were like kids under him. Wow. And he was kind enough to teach us, help us learn things in the studio that you, you, could, you could do. Oh, man, it's just amazing. Wow. And wow. he's still with us, thank God. And, and he ended up doing music for video games, I believe, and other things. And he's just super, super talented. Sure, He's sure. like a one-man band. He can play instruments. He can write. 
produce, conduct, everything, everything. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, he did. He did paid in full, and that's that's an amazing album. It is. It it's is an amazing, amazing album. album, and that was Patrick. Wow. That's Patrick all the way, beginning to end. Yeah. He took something and took it to a whole other level. Sure, sure, that's sure. A lot of a lot of engineers did that, and probably still do. And unfortunately, you don't get credited right, or at least even um maybe a bonus payment or something like something. I really appreciate what you did for me here you go sure. you don't see that wow. unfortunately I know wow but Patrick man I'll never forget Patrick amazing wow he's an incredible incredible artist he was very helpful with Spider there was a point where Spider did a couple of songs where he sang he helped him go through that get it right okay sure very very good guy very good guy wow I think the majority of the time he spent at power play wow yep me him Nordy I remember when I got there, Julian Hirschfeld was like the chief engineer, but eventually he left. I don't think that genre of music was really where he was going. Sure. So he moved on to something probably bigger and better. Yeah. And then we stood there. Yeah. And we kind of built it. We yeah, built yeah, it from yeah. the ground up, and eventually we got a second building with a with a with an SSL in it. Then we replaced a Trident board with an SSL in the original mm, building. Sure, sure. And a lot of Rakim stuff and KRS was done in there. Oh, okay, okay. And then mixed up the block. Yeah, and I remember, I remember reading in, in some article or interview with you, maybe, I think it was the last one that came out, where you mentioned when uh, BDP f first came in, they actually didn't record on the, the, no. uh, on the SSL, right? No, they recorded in the A room on yeah. an MCI, and it wasn't a bad console, but it wasn't an SSL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything was low budget, so initially a lot of the two inch tape that we were told to use was used okay, so we would have to sure. erase it and use it again it was like a cheaper rate that way huh? yeah because it's used they charge you less i think a reel might have been 175 if you got to use it might have been 90. okay okay i see and uh, you know as a label owner you may say i don't know what's going to come of this i don't want to spend too much sure sure but sure criminal minded as legendary and great as it sounds Quality wise, it doesn't touch by all means necessary. Yeah, yeah, by all yeah. means necessary was tracked and mixed in an SSL. I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. With on a new tape, right? T top, yeah, brand yeah, new yeah, tape, yeah. top notch gear. Yeah. And I was involved from the scratch from the beginning, so nothing got tracked wrong, nothing was too low or too high. Yeah, you there can was no, tell the difference. Yeah, you, there was no bleeding. Everything is top notch on by all means necessary. Everything. Wow, the the yeah. quality is just um, unbelievable. Whereas Criminal Mind, we did a good job, but it was also mixed sure. in the A room. And there were points where there's so many things needed to be punched out, we needed four hands. So I would hold these buttons. I would tell Chris, on the count of three, push them in and pull them out. SSL, I could do it by myself because I just programmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, wow. back up the tape, click, clip, back up the tape, click, and then run it, and it all happens. Wow. We couldn't do that in the A room. Wow. No. The A room didn't have that kind of, you know, of, uh, of, of uh, recording technology or, or mixing technology. So we had to do it by hand. Wow. Yep. Wow. Um... So there, I I know there's a whole lot more we could we could get into, um, uh, but uh, I, but I want to be um, respectful of uh, of your time and um, and most people usually start getting a little a little tired around uh, uh, two hours the two hours uh -huh. which I think we're probably at right now. So I have a final question for you at least for now, sure. um, which is uh, uh, you can keep it. Uh, uh, hip hop recordings, or you can keep it to any any aspect of your career, mm -hmm. um, or or just you know broader life that you want. But what are, what are some of the things that you're proudest of, either in your career, or your life, um, so far? My career, uh, my music career as an engineer and a producer, I'm mostly proud of the fact that I opened the doors for a lot of a lot of future engineer producers especially Latinos sure sure they sure. may not be aware of it and that's fine but prior to Ivan Doc Rodriguez if you look back you're gonna find a lot of break dancers sure. some rappers because Tito and then they sure. here there but you're not gonna find any any Latino in the studio that engineered mixed DJ edited did okay. the whole thing mind you I didn't even touch on the fact that I even rhymed on some records. Oh, other than the spider, okay. I mean the, uh, other than the the thing for KRS. Sure, sure, sure. I also did a quick project where Spider D came in with a Christmas song and told me I have this great Christmas song and I had a track and he yeah. had the lyrics. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. he said, but I can't record. I said, why not? He goes, because I'm on pr profile. Uh, I can't do it for another label. And he said, why don't you do it? 
Okay, and I'm saying, so, I'm not a rapper. He goes, yeah. you can do it. So I ended up rapping on a song. Wow. It was a joke. It was yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sure. was years ago. And now that song is, is in a compilation of the greatest hip-hop Christmas songs in history. <laughs> Figure that out. And it was because he so told amazing. me to do it. And I did it. Yeah. And yeah. they paid me. And I'm like, wow. I'm not a rapper. But again, yeah, not sure. that difficult for certain things. Yeah. So that I also did. So again, as an artist, I was an artist with, with uh, The Chosen One. So having done all that... And I haven't been able to have the opportunity to change what hip hop sounds like. Sure. That's huge. Absolutely. Um, something I'm very proud of. So that's big for me because I opened doors. Um, I did it with dignity and respect. I didn't cut any corners. Um, you didn't I didn't tear anyone else down. No, absolutely it. not. I didn't step on anybody. I didn't defame anyone. I treated everyone with respect. And, uh, and I enjoyed every moment of it, including the difficult ones, because I grew from them. Sure. So that would be in music, that would be that. As far as a DJ, and this is something maybe only my closest, closest friends have ever heard, because I don't, again, I don't speak much about this, but I started as a DJ, and I took that very seriously. Sure. Um, and I got to the point where I became so good at blending the music, selecting it, doing all of this with limited technology, I was positive, absolutely positive, that I was the best in the city. Yeah, yeah. And in that, I thought, if I'm the best in the city, then right now, I'm the best in the whole world. Yeah, cause, because there's nobody better than New York. Sure, sure, sure. And I went to clubs and they were great DJs and very popular for whatever they did, but I said, humbly, he can't touch me when it comes to creativity and blending. Yeah. Because yeah, what yeah. I do is insane. It's just my ideas are absolutely insane. Sure. And um, so for that moment of time, I said, nobody's better at this than me. Yeah. But I kept it to myself. Sure. Except the handful of people that maybe knew what I did and, and knew what level I did it at. Yeah. So as far as the DJ, and I went from, from being a DJ to becoming a producer and all these other things. So as a DJ, that was something I'm very proud of to, to, to take my... my my uh, profession to a level with such limited resources Absolutely. was a, a very big thing for me because I couldn't afford to do what others could do, but I found a way to do it with less and I did it better. Absolutely. So yeah, that yeah, was yeah. for that. Um, my personal life, um, I pride myself in being a, a great father sure, and, sure. Um, and a brother and a family person. I got that from my, my wonderful aunts and my mother. Um, they were very loving to me. so. I took in as much as I could of that, and I try to give that out. I try to be polite to everybody and treat people with respect and kindness. So I'm very proud of that part. Um, and and coming from Hell's Kitchen, where majority of my friends die, sure, I sure. remember at 15, literally believing I wouldn't pass 20 yeah, yeah, because yeah. of what I saw. So I literally believed either a stray bullet something crazy is going to happen but to get out of here by 20 i don't know if i can do it absolutely and with god's graces i, I was able to get out i was able to excel and since i do everything with a humble state of mind still till today i didn't realize the impact i had and every time i returned to hell's kitchen to visit my friends and partake in things they would show so much pride and like i saw you in this video and i saw you in madison and i saw and i said yeah, it was, it was one of the jobs I had. Yeah. Later on, I said, wow, you know, I've done a lot that I don't even, you know, unless my daughter happens to tell me, Dad, don't you remember this? And, you know, you did this or a record's playing on the radio. She goes, isn't that your song? I don't give it thought. Yeah, for So sure. sometimes it's good to think back and go, wow, you know, I made a big difference. Absolutely. So that, mean, that means a lot to me. Absolutely. So coming again from Hell's Kitchen, like when I was in Germany, looking up at the moon, I'm saying, <laughs> wow, you know, I'm here. I could have been... In jail, absolutely, needles yeah, yeah, sticking yeah. out of my arm, and things of this nature. And God's blessed me with these opportunities. And I made the best of them. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. didn't squander them. I didn't, you know. I said, let me make the best, and whatever I do, even if it doesn't work, I'm gonna give it my all. Absolutely. So I think that's the main point of everything. Everything I do, I give it my all, and um, if it doesn't work, I try my best. Yeah, just like just like uh, your uh, your your productions must rock. Everything. That's it. Must rock. I, I, I <laughs> must as best I can. That's what I'm gonna do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For always. Sure. It's always gonna be that way. Um, you know, this coming year, in a few, in a couple of months, I'll be in, doing a Puerto Rican Day Parade, and I'll do that to the best of my ability. Absolutely. You know, I'll be prepared. Everything will be great, and there'll be another experience that I, I would have uh, li likely would have never happened if 
I wouldn't have left 48th Street and met Spider D. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, true if is none of that would have happened. Wow. None of it would have happened. Well, uh, well, well, Doc, is there are there are there is there anything else that you want to share at at the moment? Um, Gosh, I, I, we could go on forever. There's so <laughs> much, know, so much. We could. I mean, you know, I you barely scraped the surface. On yeah, it. yeah. So there's, there's just so many things with music and and um, the sacrifices, in not only music but at, at, at the studio and. In, all that, but uh, you know, I, I'm I'm good. Well, I really appreciate you taking all of this time, and I mean, you know, these stories that you shared today, like incredible and, and invaluable too, for getting, you know, a, getting the history of, I mean, not only hip hop but just music in general for the last 50 years, getting that getting that history right. Um, Absolutely, and I think anybody involved in anything, music, acting, whatever it is. Um, do your research. Don't take shortcuts. Absolutely. You might make money quickly, but at the end of the day, when you're all by yourself without the hype, you don't feel so good about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you give it your all, even if you don't make the money you think you deserve, you you know it's you. You know it's your work. Absolutely. It's like cooking a great meal and no one knows it's you, and they taste it and it's like, wow, that's wonderful. Did your mother do it? Did your grandmother do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you don't need to take the credit. You just know I did my best. Absolutely. And anything they do, anybody does, music especially, don't take shortcuts. For sure. Because you can use, hear it. You, yeah, you can hear some, it. Absolutely. And other people can hear and, it. And, and the problem is when people start applauding and yelling, you you lose track and you believe your own funk. Yeah, yeah, No, yeah. Put, put the hard work in and years later, here's a last point, great point. I started in 84 going into 85. Okay. My professional career. Sure. We're in 2022. My records are still on the radio. Yeah, they are. They are. My records are still on the radio. Yeah. They still sound outrageous. Um, think about that. When you go into any project, how is it going to sound 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now? Most of what you hear, you won't be able to compare it because it's not going to play 30 years Absolutely. from now. Absolutely. When you go in like that, thinking this might be my last project, this might measure me as a person, as a producer, whatever, that's when you really give it your all. Give it your all. Don't yeah. shortcut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't shortcut. Give it your all. Take that extra hour or two. Do what you got to do to make that record get to another level, and you'll notice your records will just keep getting better and better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. take shortcuts, you're gonna be okay for a minute. Yeah. Then you're gonna disappear. Absolutely. And that's not what you want. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Doc. It's My been pleasure. A real pleasure. Absolutely.